Okay, it's um, two minutes past two in Accra and two minutes past four in Johannesburg and two minutes past five in East Africa. This is the Salt Institute and Intercessors for Africa public lecture. It's the fourth annual public lecture. So I want to welcome all of you. But before we go into the lecture, uh, may I request that one of us, Mr. Michael Ama, uh, offers a short prayer uh, before we dive deeper. Mr. Ama, if you can hear me, please come in and share with the prayer. All right. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. Kofi. Um, let's pray. Father, we are grateful to you for the blessing of life today. Thank you for this all-important public lecture and all the persons connecting across the continent. We ask that you speak to our continent through our distinguished speakers. And as we engage in this discourse, we pray that we'll arrive at the very salient point that will bring Africa the transformation that we seek to achieve through these public lectures. We ask this blessing through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ama. Thank you for a powerful launch of this um, public lecture. This, as I said, is the fourth annual public lecture. So a very special welcome to you all to this lecture that is organized by the Intercessors for Africa and Sandalos Advanced Leadership Salt Institute. The purpose of this public lecture is to stimulate discourse on leadership and transformation around the African continent. Over the last three years, it has attracted experts in various fields from different countries who have engaged in different thematic areas. Today's lecture will focus on a very important topic relating to the transformation of the continent. It is our hope that um, this discourse today will continue way after this lecture has come to an end in our homes, in our small groups, in our countries to increase the conversation among the populace of the continent. Today's lecture therefore focuses on a very important issue, aid. So the topic is Kiovadis Africa. Where is Africa headed after six decades of aid failure? Kiovadis Africa. Where is Africa headed? after six decades of aid failure. So these are two very important questions. But first, let me introduce myself. I am Mauli Kofi, and I am the Director of Corporate and Business Strategy at the SORT Institute and also a lecturer. Together with my colleague, Catherine Langat, who will be responsible for hosting the lecture today. Um, I would like to invite uh, Catherine to briefly introduce herself. Thank you, Dr. Kofi, and a very good evening from Nairobi. I'm Catherine Langat, a Master's of Arts in International Relations and Diplomacy graduate of Salt Institute. And indeed, together with a very seasoned Dr. Kofi, it's a pleasure to host you all in yet another enlightening and insightful public lecture which I have no doubt will leave indelible prints in your hearts and minds. Today's topic is not only a contemporary one, but a very relevant question to pose. And at Thought Institute, we not only pose well-founded questions, but also go an extra step to propose solutions, not just any random solutions, but divine solutions to the demanding questions that are worth being asked. 
And today is not any different. In the next two hours, please be prepared to capture some solid and enduring observations from both our keynote speaker and discussant. We welcome you all. Please, Dr. Kofi, back to you. Thank you very much for such a very illuminating uh, self-introduction and a very succinct highlight of what we should expect this afternoon. The lecture and the entire session will be in English and translated into French. So make sure you select your language preference from the tools at the bottom of your webinar screen. Um, interpretation, and then you can choose the language preference to be sure that you are in the right language room. Uh, before we go any further, I want to acknowledge uh, a few people, the chairman of the Network of Intercessors for Africa and the chairman of the trustees of the SALT Institute, our eminent panelists that will be introducing in due course, distinguished participants across the globe, the organizing committee of the Intercessors for Africa SALT Institute Public Lectures, the technical team that is putting this lecture together from different countries. The last but not the least, our team of interpreters across the continent who have been joined together by the power of technology. Please remember once again to select your language preference. And so um, let me take this opportunity to give you how this lecture will proceed. Uh, we will introduce the panelists, uh, starting with the respondent, um, who will be introduced by my co-moderator, Catherine. And then we will take a poll, a short poll, to warm ourselves up to the conversation. And then after the poll, uh, the keynote speaker will take uh, the stage to make his remarks. And then after that, we'll take another poll and then we'll invite the respondent to speak. After that, we'll take a short poll and then um, we will now allow you to interact with the speakers. Please use the Q&A room to post your questions. And for all of us, use the Q&A room also to interact. If questions are posed and you think you can respond, feel free to respond. If you want to add something more to the question, feel free to do so. The entire session, we hope, will last two hours. With that, um, I want to invite Catherine to introduce um, the respondent to this lecture. Catherine, please over to you. Thank you, Dr. Kofi. And indeed, it's my pleasure to introduce our respondent, our discussant for today's session, Dr. Nsabiseng Moleko. Dr. Moleko is a development economist and a core faculty member at the University of Stellenbosch Business School. USB, where she teaches economics and statistics as a senior lecturer since 2017. As a former CEO at a development agency, project manager and researcher at the Eastern Cape Socioeconomic Consultative Council, she has worked extensively in the economic development landscape. She also serves as a commissioner for the Commission for Gender Equality appointed by the president in 2017 and is currently the deputy chairperson of the commission. The Minister of Trade and Industry appointed her as a board of trustee for the National Empowerment Fund, where she chaired the board's investment committee between 2018 to 2020. The Minister of Higher Education appointed her as a member of the Ikala TV, Tibet uh, College Council in 2014, where she served as the deputy chairperson member of EXCO and chairperson of the academic board. Dr. Moleko holds 
uh, and honors in business science economics from University of Cape Town and an MPhil in development finance from Stellenbosch Business School. She has completed her PhD in development finance at USB on pension funds and national development and is the first South African woman to be conferred a doctorate in that in this field. A very seasoned speaker we have for this afternoon this evening. Please Dr. Kofi, back to you to introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you very much, Catherine, and a very special welcome to you, Dr. Moleko. It's such a great honor to have you as a panelist in this lecture. Um, our keynote speaker is a very highly accomplished individual academically and uh, has impacted the world in several fields, uh, particularly in Africa and the United States. He is a leadership and management professor at Vitebo University, La Crosse, Western USA. He designs and teaches leadership courses, including meaningful, ethical, and practical servant leadership and mission, vision, and virtues in organizations. He is a leadership and management consultant and a civic educationist. Our speaker has a 22-year progressive academic and career experience spanning from media practitioner, international community development consulting, research fellow, manager in the corporate world, among others, to a present traditional university professor role. He is an author of five books, including Leadership is Concept Heavy, a case against fragmented theories in evolutionary and contemporary leadership, counting the count in business consulting, ideation of top 40 business consultants, political party followership, and political leadership in Africa, hands-on teaching and evidence-based learning in Africa, and servant leaders, the greatest among us from research to practice. This is, this is why he has been appointed global ambassador for the SALT Institute and has already shown a strong commitment to the vision and mission of SALT. As a son of the continent, he's equally um, very much interested in how we can bring changes to the development agenda of the continent. So ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome our guest speaker for tonight, Professor Inok Opoku Antri. As I said, Professor will be taking the stage in due course, but before Professor Antri comes, Opoku Antri comes, please take this quick poll to set the stage for the conversation. Um, may I invite um, our technical team to um, activate the poll and it should take us just a few minutes. The first poll is, what do you consider the most important ris uh, reason for the failure of aid to transform Africa? You have to choose one. What do you consider the most important reason for the failure of aid to transform Africa? The first answer is the design of the aid architecture itself maintains dependence. Two, limited absorption capacity in Africa. Three, highly inefficient, ineffective governments. And four, unfavorable conditions attached to aid. Um, now, I may I ask our participants, functionaries, all of us who want to share their opinion on this question, please check your preference and we'll close and declare the results as quickly as possible. Unless you are a host or a panelist, 
you have a vote. So please go ahead and vote and uh, let's see your votes. We will be done in just 30 seconds. So just click one of the options based on your own understanding of the situation and based on your appreciation of what it is that uh, makes it not to have made the right connection on the continent. Okay, we are doing well. Um, we'll be ending the poll in the next 20 seconds. So in 20 seconds, please, technical team, you can close the poll and let's declare the results. Yes, voila, this is where we are. Um, most of you think uh, that the problem has to do with the, the, the inefficient and ineffective governments. 65% of you think that way, followed by the architecture of the aid itself is designed to keep us permanently dependent on it. In other words, you are saying that it gives us addiction. Uh, only a few of you said that the conditions attached to aid make it impossible to transform our continent. Thank you for your thoughts, but this is just a conversation. And so um, you can't continue the conversation at your own level. On this note, I want to kindly invite, kindly join me as we welcome Professor Enoch Upokwanchi, our keynote speaker. Prof, over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mauli Kofi. And uh, Catherine, thank you very much for the intros. I just saw you last week, and now you are in Kenya. That's, that's awesome. All right, uh, I want to thank all of you for joining us. Today is going to be exciting because we are going to talk about where we are heading to as Africans for the past 60 years with aid. And after I finish sharing my PowerPoint and sharing all the ideas with you, we will see whether we are all right picking highly ineffective and inefficient governments or the architecture of the aid itself as the reason why we have where we are now. So quickly, I want to share my slide with you. Who values Africa? Where is Africa headed to after six decades of aid? So if you look at, I, fortunately I worked with the German Technical Corporation a couple of years ago and uh, we were into small town water projects. So the German government was paying 90% of the cost and the Ghana government is supposed to pay 10%. But the Ghana government decided to share the 10% with the communities that are benefiting from the water system. So the communities will pay 5% and then the Ghana government will pay percent be ready. And then the Ghana 5% and the community 5% will not be ready. So we were forced to use the District Assembly Common Fund from source to pay for the communities. And the district chief executives will not allow us because they will not get percentage from that kind of money that we are using to make water for them. All projects with aid also have a time period. So five years, seven years, after that period, they give all the resources and the cash to the government. And only you and I can tell where the cars also go. So we'll see what happens after this. Now, I want to start with George Bernard Shaw. He said that be aware of false knowledge. It's more dangerous than ignorance. So have we been receiving false knowledge about 
eight or not? We'll see. So let's see the story of us. We know that most African countries started with the Portuguese coming in here and then uh, they started trading and they never used religion. Then we also saw them trading in salt, gin, gold, all sort of things. And then the Dutch came in and finally the British came in and took over. But from the time that Ghana was the first in South Saharan Africa to have independence until most African countries started having independence from the 60s, early 60s, we've been marking time and we are not heading towards the right direction. So this is the story of us. Morgan Freeman talked about forces that shape societies around the globe. He talked about war and peace. Unfortunately, Africa have picked a lot of wars and peace since our independence. And then love and belief. Yes, we believe there are a lot of love among us, but we are still divided into tribes and clans and then power and freedom. I think we are more of a freedom society, but we have a lot of leaders who are power drunk. Then what do we believe in? Do we believe in the power of science, exploration, innovation, and storytelling? I think storytelling, we are doing well. Innovation, no. Exploration, maybe to short extent. And then power of science, we have not been there yet. So that is another area that we are lacking. Now, people can develop from culture alone, according to, I'm just giving you a snapshot of the literature. Culture alone can develop people. But if you look at across Africa, our culture, what are the values that we are teaching our children? So just get into your various cultures. Beautiful cultures, we are proud people, but what are the values that comes out of those cultures? I think that is lacking because it doesn't make our cultures progressive. So our cultures are becoming static because of lack of values in them. Then we have poor mentality with a belief that dependence help. You have Africa where people are begging on the streets, People believe that I can go anywhere and depend on another person for survival instead of trying to look for things for their own. You know, at the time of creation, God gave us how to find food. You have to hunt for food. You have to find clothing to cover your nakedness and then shelter to cover yourself. Else the, the rigors of the weather will kill you. Now, these are our survival instincts. When that is taken away from you, it means your brain is being taken away from you. And that is the trick that aid is playing on Africa. So if you look at it, that the dependence, does it help? I don't think to a moment time again for that kind of help. If you can't even Ghana, for instance, after the Ghana had independence in 1957, it got to a point, getting to 1966, people were in a line queuing for toilet roll until the NLC, the National Liberation Council came in. And that was the first time the military people took Ghana to the IMF for money. And since that time, we've gone there almost 17 times. So that is another issue. Now, if you go to depend on somebody, it creates the impression that, you know, you are poor and you want somebody to help you in the way you manage your own things. That is not the way we want our system to go. Also, the big question is that, is there any clear link between foreign aid and underdevelopment in Africa? I think your guess is as good as mine. Uh, we've given reasons and I respect the reasons that the poll gave that we talk about inefficient and ineffective governments. And then the architecture of the aid itself. Well, somebody's giving you aid and they will have their own architecture, but do you need it or do you have to go for it? I believe that with all the resources we have, we are even lucky. We can buy any resource in the world. We can buy the best airplanes. We can buy the best ships all over the world because we have the resources to do so. Unfortunately, the resources that we have, we've not been able to harness it to make the best purchase of it. Let me give you one example here of what I saw from the Ghana Business News yesterday. It said Africa exported 6 billion worth of coffee in 2021. But after processing final products, they were sold for 100 billion abroad. So all the coffee we had, we sold them for 6 billion. But after processing by the West and selling them back to us and themselves, they made over 100 billion. So look at it. How are we adding value to what we have? 
And then there's also no agreement on the appropriate answers to these questions because without a proper understanding of the culture of the people, you throw in aid and it doesn't solve the problem, according to Andrew. So this is the catch. If you look all over the world, in the advanced world, they don't throw money at problems. They throw ideas at problems. So always they're looking for the next big idea. And the idea solve the problems, not the money. We look for money thinking that the money is going to solve the problem. And that is why we keep going to bet for money, thinking that it's going to solve the problem and never get solved. So it has created, it has created what we call the clinical or the cyclical lazy and lavish mentality for most Africans. And this is coming from the literature. So you become lazy thinking that in that dire moment, somebody will come to your aid and then you go and get the money. But if you know that there's nobody who's going to help you, immediately you will think about how to get that resources. There's a book by a guy called Moyo, and the book is titled Dead Aid by a guy called Jambisa Moyo, Why It Is Not Working. And he talked about aid being a trap. And I think I, I agree with him that, you know, we've been trapped by aid, thinking that anytime we go there, there's going to be a rescue point. But we keep going there, we keep going there. And I think that if that door has been shut on us, we'll be thinking about where to go next and working hard. I believe what Magafuli did in, in Tanzania, he was, when he became president, he decided not to get aid, not to send a lot of people to UN conferences uh, in New York. And he would send just three or four people instead of 150 and 200, all the trainings, professional development, going to hotels and spending money and all those cars. He cut those expenditures and he was able to raise almost 4 billion of the local money to build a new dam. So some of these ideas are what we need. We don't necessarily need that peanut that we are getting from them. We need to internally generate our own money to build things for ourselves so that we can own it and be proud of what we've been able to do. I can confidently say here that all the AIDS stuff that we receive after a while, five, 10 years, go back to those communities. And then you see there's no results. Everything is wiped away because when people do not have ownership, they don't really take good care of what they have. But once you contributed to making it, you take good care of it. So another issue here is that, and I agree with the structure of the Somebody talked about the texture of the aid itself. If you look at what is happening there for these foreign expatriates coming in with the aid staff, one thing is that look at their professional background from the governors who started from the early 60s, you know, when Africa, most African countries had independence, you will see clearly that most of the governors that came to Africa were not highly educated. Even those who are coming here to take care of the aid money, these aid issues, some of them are bricklayers, some of them are carpenters, some of them, they, they are not highly educated. Most of them are high school leaders coming to Africa to manage aid money. And look at how they pay themselves and the luxurious places that they stay and the chunk of money that they use in paying themselves. So in the end, most of the money goes back to them. If you have watched the recent aid coming from the Chinese government, you will see that it comes with a lot of people from China who comes to make sure they do the job. And those guys have been paid by the Chinese government into the account in China. So you can see that most of the aid money also goes back to the same people who they call the technical advisors because they take the money to pay them. They come to lead a reserve's life here. And then in the end, the people who are supposed to be the right beneficiary of the aid don't get it. Then we also have this, that is there's an unfair global economic structure. But the question is, how did we structure our economy that we are at a disadvantage when it comes to the structure. And here there's a guy called Akono in 2008. He's arguing that aid in Africa is a banned aid. So it's not a long-term solution. It's just like going to IMF. IMF was established for the advanced world to control the developing countries. So they will give you short-term measures to stabilize your economy, but you'll never be prosperous going to IMF. No way. You will never be prosperous. They will give you something and conditions so that your economy will be stable for a short term. But in the long term, no, you're not going to be prosperous. So if you're looking for the long term prosperity, then aid and going to IMF or the World Bank is not our solution. But unfortunately, we are so dependent on these guys that we keep going to them. So how did we get here? 
The other structurally dependent economies, that is where we are struggling. We need to be dependent. And the dependency comes from this. We are the only continent in the world which consumes what we don't produce and produce what we don't consume. So most of the things that we consume, we import them. And anytime you are importing from another country, you are creating job for them. And that is not where we want to go. So if we, this guy is also saying something that is important. The Akono guy is saying that for long-term sustainable impact, he is thinking that if those giving us aid really are thinking about Africa, then why are they not thinking about transcontinental projects such as highways, telecommunication, and power plant? So as you saw, why are the Chinese thinking about containers at the port? And they are looking at the mining sectors where they will get short-term gains and then go back to the country. But they are not thinking about interhighways in Africa, telecommunications, because they don't have our interest. Mandela said something very important. He said that it's not every other country that wishes Africa very well. It's not everybody who wishes that well. So we have to be picking and choosing who we should trade with and who we should get aid from because it's not every other country that is thinking well about Africa. Look at the Chinese. They come to most African countries that are even worse. They don't care. When you are fighting, we are looting your resources and we should be watching for that. So there's a back also in our learning system, Africa educational system. The curriculum need a new design. The way we have designed our curriculum is not hand, hands on and evidence based. So you can see that it lasts a lot of academic advising. It's very rigid, not flexible. It's very somber and serious. It's not joyful. It's single path, not multi path. It's close ended, not me centered. And then we are very competitive. So we list this person is number one in the class, number two, number three to the last. But in the advanced world, it's more collaborative. And then ours is very verbal, not multi-sensory. And then we control a lot instead of nurturing in our education system. So if you look at the Bloom taxonomy, where you are giving just syllables, and then you are giving definition, it's not learning. Learning doesn't take place there. Learning takes place when you are analyzing and synthesizing and then evaluating. Because education is not for consumption, it's for creation. So if you are learning and you are not creating anything out of it, that is not learning. But that is where, unfortunately, we find ourselves in education. Well, we should be thinking about changing our curriculum to make sure that it aligns with everything that is going on today. Now, after two years of COVID, do you know what the world is heading at? Mental health. The youth is having a lot of problem with mental health. Do we have any curricula that is looking at mental health so that we embed it into education? No, nope. we are not looking at that. We even don't have that kind of research culture because academia is delineated from politics in such a way that even the research, quality research that is being done in Africa, the politicians are not using them for their policies. But in the advanced world, that is what is happening. They work in collaboration with academia so that all the advices are coming from academia. It helps a lot because it is assumed that academia is very neutral when it comes to policy formulation. Then we also have inadequate public goods. See, no country has ever developed without public goods. And private goods survive on public goods. So we know public goods are an example of roads, hospitals, public schools. These are public goods. And individuals or private people cannot do this. So the government is supposed to build public goods so that the private goods can build on that. Unfortunately, we have terrible roads. We even have almost 64% of our roads in Africa untied. And the rural areas, we know what happened. Even clinics, getting access to the clinics is a problem. So public goods are lacking. And that is why private goods cannot thrive in Africa. I'm told that Michelin, uh, the tire making company was in Nigeria and now they have relocated to Egypt because of uh, power outages. They were not making any profit. We also have interdependence and perception that it's all about government. We, we just gave uh, a ruling here on favorable, you know, highly inefficient and ineffective government. We blame the government a lot, but who voted them into power? Is that none of us? So we can never import leaders from any other world, but ourselves. And we know the good leaders among us. Why are we so inclined to one or two political parties? We should begin to think about a third party, a third force. So if this party A or party B is not helping us, we are a people and the people should think ahead. How do you get a third force that can really help us? For me, I don't care when somebody belongs to party A or party B. 
What is important is that we have good roads, we have good bridges, we have good hospitals, we have good schools. That is what we should be looking for. Our commitment to one political party, whether good or bad, is also killing Africans. Because we are so glued to one political party that it doesn't matter. It's our tribe, it's our tradition, it's this. So whether the party is doing right or not, we don't care. And that is really hurting us. We also don't have critical friends among us, even in, in leadership, political leadership. Why? Because if I belong to party A and I criticize the party, they would think that I'm destroying that party. And because of that, people don't speak you know, against their political party when they are wrong. The other point is that there's lack of orientation to believe that what we can do instead of always blaming the politicians. What are the people doing? 80% of leadership, political leadership, is followership. So what are the political followers also doing to make sure that uh, the leaders are held accountable? We've also lost brains to the political party inclination perception. Anytime you speak, they will tag you, you belong to this party or you belong to that party. So people don't have the same minds anymore because once you are tagged as belonging to party A or party B, it means that whatever you say, it doesn't matter how sensible it, it takes, people will still not want to listen to you. And that is very unfortunate. We also have lack of ownership. I think I've touched on this. Uh, we have a situation where the politicians who are public servants are not even using public goods. So the Public figures are not using, even when the president is going to a place and the road is terrible, he will make sure that they cut the, the road a day before the president comes in. So he will not see the bad road. We have a situation where they are not patronizing public transport. They are not patronizing public schools. They are not patronizing public hospitals. And because of that, they don't feel what the ordinary citizen also feel. And that is a big problem. I've even been told that we have a situation where even headmasters and headmistresses of public schools are not sending their own kids to the same school. Why? Because they don't believe in that system. And that is very unfortunate in Africa. We also have a problem with the African Union, toothless bulldog. You know, the African Union is cannot bite. And if you go to African Union meetings, I've attended a couple of them. If you go to Addis Ababa or any other place, the African Union meets. It's terrible. The post child, those who are sitting there, they are thinking about just their salaries and then their per diem. They are not even there to deliberate on the goodness of their country. It's all about the money that they will get from it. And that is terrible. One thing I've observed from Africa is that in, in Europe and in North America, when people have the chance to serve in public service, they think that is a big honor. So they are looking for ways to make your job easy. But in our part of the world, public service, they frustrate you. And I don't understand. So the other thing is that politics have more power than we the people. We've given more power to these politicians, but they are supposed to be just servants, serving us. So we shouldn't be giving more power to politicians. The people, we the people still have the power to rule our world. This is the hard truth. No developed country will develop your country for you. We have to do it for ourselves. The Asian Tigers did it for themselves and Africans, we have to develop ourselves. But look at the resources, the plethora of human resources that we have at the bellies of our land. Talk about sea, land, you plant anything and it grows, throw anything on the ground, it grows. And yet we can make good use of it. And that is unfortunate. Also, studies have shown that aid develops future taste for foreign products. And here I gave Hurricane Katrina in America where Japan donated some items to the people of Louisiana. And I saw Americans made fun of it. I went to Louisiana myself at that time. A lot of people made fun of it, that what are we doing with Japanese products in America? Because the Japanese people wanted Americans to taste their products. And it told me that at a time you get aid from other countries, they are gradually helping you to develop taste for their products. So it's kind of a future advert they are making for their products. That's one of the key hidden instruments in giving aid. So if we, I also happen to be in this project with ADRA, the Adventist Development and Relief Agency with USAID, and we were giving rice to farmers. So this is funny, and you will laugh at this. A couple of years ago, I think in 2000, 2003, I was working with the USAID, Adventist Development and Relief Agency. And River Densu, which is the longest river in Ghana here, get dried in the dry 
so there will be no water for people to drink. Up the river is drying, so let's plant cassia trees so that they will shelter the river and to not dry during the dry season. It's a white person who discovered that, not us. Now, after that, they decided, USAID decided that if you plant one acre of the acacia tree, they will give you one bag of rice. So food for work was what the project was. And guess what? Some farmers will say that I've planted 100 acres. You go and measure and it's just 50 acres. They think that some white people are giving free rice and they are getting it. But that wasn't the case. So sometimes when we finish this project, it developed the taste of these farmers for American rice, but not their local rice. So think about the taste that it also make for. Then aid will never make you prosperous. I've already said about this. And we have leadership that is corrupt. And some of these aid money never get to the soil that it's supposed to be. Go to the northern part of most of the African countries, Kaduna, go to uh, most northern part of Ghana. Every 15 minutes, you see a non-profit car, an NGO car. They are all trying to help. Learning, uh, women empowerment, uh, you know, women health, learning, all that. But yet we are not getting results. So aid is just a temporary relief. It, it is never free. And we all know that most aid money is also stolen or misplaced. So what moments are we chasing after 60 years? We all have a situation where there is aid fatigue. The donors are tired of us. And we are saying that we are even beyond aid. Ghana has a mantra that Ghana beyond aid. I have a couple of, sorry about that. I had to drink some water. I have a couple of friends who are wise and they were telling me that they find it fascinating when Ghana talk about beyond aid. And when Ghana talk about beyond aid, the president gave it to the senior minister at that time. There was a guy who is now the, the chief whip who I happen to remember and I wrote an, an article about Ghana beyond it. So I know, you know what Ghana is heading to us in, in this case. And they gave me this scenario. Think about five brothers in a home where all of them are working hard and only one brother is lazy and always each of the four brothers will give the other brother who is lazy, get this money, get this money. And one day that brother stands up and says, I am beyond taking your money. I'm beyond it. Now the question the four brothers will ask themselves is, has he got some money somewhere? Or how is he going to survive without our help? And that is how they see Ghana when Ghana talk about beyond aid. You are coming to them every time you are coming to them. You are, you are not self-sustaining now. And then you are saying you are beyond aid. So what are you doing to be beyond it? You shouldn't just be saying it, but you walk the talk. And that is what is lacking here. So have you seen any impact of their activities? Well, not many impact have been made. Like I said, it's a short-term gap, but the long-term is not helping us. Then government funds, if you go to the ministries and agencies and department, government funds is not coming. So it's these donor agencies' money that is helping them. And unfortunately, most of the money that you see coming to the agencies, they also spend it on things like cars and training and professional development, and it doesn't get to the roots. I put something here. If you come to Ghana and most Af African countries, the number of even primary schools, the Ministry of Education are not aware of the numbers. The nonprofits are aware of it because some schools are beyond the rivers that nobody can go there. But these A people go there. And that is very sad. There's also this study that said that after independence, we know India, they picked technology from the British after colonization. And we picked their language, we picked their dressing, and then we picked their names. So, the most important thing, which is technology, we did not pick it. And that has not helped us. So we've also lost our identity in doing that. Kwame Krumah said that we prefer self governance with danger to service and tranquility. And he said the black person or the black man is capable of managing his own affairs. Unfortunately, we have struggled at the economic front in managing our own affairs. Are we capable? Yes. Are we able? Yes. Are we willing? No. So the willingness is not there. Anytime we talk about capability, two things should come to play, the willingness and the ability. We are able to do it, but we are not willing. And why we have not been willing to work together in solving our own problems or managing our own affairs, only God can tell. Do we have plans for self-actualization? No. If you look at history from independence, ask yourself why that most of the leaders Nyerere, Nze, Jomo Kenyatta, I'm talking about Nkrumah, 
Kamuzu Bandes and the others, why did they put most of their political opponents in jail? That also costs us a lot. So if you look at the trend, you can see that there's a problem with dissenting views. And that bothers on personal development. So that kind of personal development where we work together to build a common agenda has not been there. We keep tearing ourselves apart. If you go to the advanced country, it's not like that. Political opponents are not put to jail because they don't agree with the person in power. If you look at, I'll talk very soon about institutions, how institutions work. If you look at America, sometimes it was difficult as a leadership professor, it was difficult for me to teach leadership when Donald Trump was a president. Why? Because he is a transactional leader. And you know, Trump tried to break American democracy. But because the institutions were strong, he could not. Other than that, he could have destroyed American democracy because he thought everything was against him and he wanted to change everything. So when the institutions are strong, nobody can come and then change anything. So think about why we were putting most of our people. So we built a lot of harbors and bridges and everything, but the human capital development was lacking because we put a lot of our opponents in jail. We didn't want to hear dissenting views. But one of the laws of leadership is that you have to learn how to use your enemies and enemies in quotes. Your political opponents are not your enemies, but in Africa, we have not learned to use them. It's always the winner takes all. So let's say there's an election. Somebody gets 52% and win, and another person gets 48% and lose. The, the, the one with the 48% lose everything, and the one with the 52% wins everything. And for four years, those who had 48% will be pulling the 52% down for four years. So they will never agree with anything that the 52% would do. And when it turn around the next election, the same thing. So we keep tearing each other apart and pulling each other down. That has not helped us. So I've talked about India that rejected the British religion, name, address, dressing system, and the food, and even language. But they adopted their technology. So today look at India. And that tells you with the statistics that you are seeing on the screen that you can be religious and prosperous at the same time. So people talk about African religion has made us poor. No, Israel is religious, they are rich. If you go to Saudi Arabia, they are religious. Go to Dubai, Bahrain, yes, they, they are religious and they are rich. So yes, your religion, you can still hold dear to that and still be prosperous. And I think we've not been able to balance the two. That is a problem. So I've given some ideas here about why India is still using their language. And people are talking, uh, language development is really key. I'll quickly talk about that. It's really key that if we don't develop our language, it's gonna be a problem. It doesn't matter whether you have five developed languages that people can you know, use, but we need to develop our own language and be proud of our language. So Nigeria, I've given an example here, more than 80 acres of arable land, but they import food. Same to most African countries, we import food. I'm being told that even guinea fowl, we are importing guinea fowl into Ghana, when in the northern region, you can have a lot of guinea fowls. Even tomatoes, we are importing tomatoes. If you go from Madrid, in Spain, to Barcelona, or let's say from London to Coventry, recently I was there, to Coventry, you see that every acre of land is developed. You are planting something or there are animals somewhere. But if you come to Africa, large areas of land is uncultivated. Nobody's touching it. Nobody's doing anything about that. And the question is, why are we leaving our lands bare and not planting anything on it when we could have put it to good use to plant all kinds of crops instead of importing them from other countries? So we have here a guy from Nigeria, Kola Masha. He said that just as oxygen is to fire, so our unemployed youth to insurgencies. That's why we see a lot of insurgencies in Africa. Our youth need jobs. So jobs, jobs, jobs. I believe that instead of giving freebies to kids and, and individuals, let's create jobs. After all, when they are working, they can pay taxes and then we get money for the country. So from Angola to Zimbabwe, from Mali to Mauritania, unemployment rate is very high from 90% to 34%. Most Africans don't have jobs that they are doing. And that is very unfortunate. So in an economic way of thinking, Paul Hain talked about economic way of thinking, and he made it clear that we struggled at the economic front. But one of the former president of America said that if Africa can catch up with the world, it is only at a can really blossom with the resources that we have.
Let's also talk quickly about perceptions. Are they real? Yes, I think it's real. Uh, we are over dependent on others. Is everything about the government? No. What role can citizens play in our own system with pride and self from the heart for our country? Patriotism is also one of the things that is lacking in Africa. We want to buy products from America. We want to, you see somebody, I've been to some hotels here, you see American flag, British flag, and even that country flag is not there. You will never see a flag of any other country in America. You never see a flag of any other country in the British. It's all about the Queen, Hilda Queen in the British. It's all about American flag, USA in America. So what is happening to our flags and the way we honor our national flag and then take pride in them. So we should begin to have that kind of patriotism because this is the only country God has given to you. Without this country, you don't have any identity. We should hold that country we have in pride and stop aligning ourselves to our tribes and our traditions and everything because without that country, you are nobody. So without Kenya, you, you because your passport say you were Kenyan. So without Kenya, it's not going to say you were Kikuyu or any other tribe, or it's not going to say you were a Frafra or Yoruba or you are, you are a, an Ever or, or a Khan or, no. It's Ghana or Kenya or Burundi or Tanzania or Angola. That country gives you identity and God in his wisdom knows why he created you in that country. We should hold our country dear, which is very important. I have a quote from John Menard Keynes. He said, a theory of economics does not furnish a body of subtle conclusions immediately applicable to policy. It's a method rather than a doctrine, an apparatus of mind and a technique of thinking which help its processor to draw correct conclusions. So the big question is, have we drawn the right conclusions in practically managing our economics since independence? The answer is a big no. The way we do our economics, we've not been able to draw the right conclusions to our problems. So why the aid failure? It's all about institutions. Our institutions have not worked. And we have a lot of Nobel Prize Prize winners who talk about institutions. They say that it's a human device constraint that structure human interaction. So institutions should structure the way we interact. Now, this is how it works. Institutions are a framework of formal and informal institutions. And we have this guy called Richard Scott. He's a leading sociologist. He identified three pillars that support institutions, regulation, normative, and their cognitive. I will talk quickly about the regulation. Regulation is the key money-making tool for every developed country. So the regulation of the law, all advanced countries are law-abiding citizens. If you flaunt the law, you pay heavily for it. I've had many tickets when I have missed my way, even at night. And then you see the camera taking a picture of me and my number plate, and then I will receive a nice letter and a fine of $500 I will have to go and pay. Now, if you are working and let's say your whole week paycheck is $500, you will not mess around by driving at 60 miles an hour when you're supposed to drive 40 miles an hour. So because the fines are hefty and you dare not tell a police officer that you are a governor or a mayor because your fine will be doubled. And because of that regulation, everybody stay tuned to the laws and then it gives them a lot of money. So regulation is a lot of money for every country. Unfortunately, in a part of the world, we have a situation where even the leaders do not obey the laws, let alone the citizens. And leaders are supposed to model the way. Unfortunately, that's not happening. So we have the former institution, which the laws and regulation that I've talked about, and then the rules. But the regulation is the tallest pillar of the three. And that is the coercive power of the government. So government use regulations to make money for the citizens. In fact, government is so easy that you don't go and have a coffee farm or a cocoa plantation, government don't do that. They go and then solicit taxes from the people to do development. And they're not supposed to take credit for this because it's not their money. It's the people's money that they are collecting from taxes and doing this. Now ask yourself, before your president, your current president became president, was he or she able to go and collect loan for the country? The answer is no. They are able to go and solicit loan from another country because you have given them the power to do so. So if they are going to hospitals abroad, ask yourself in their private life, would they have been able to raise money to go to hospitals abroad? And have you ever seen American president or the British president coming to Kenya or Ghana or South Africa for health check? No, why? Because they build the same quality health centers in their countries. They build the same quality schools in their countries. 
Unfortunately, we don't do that. And when our leaders are sick, they go to the advanced world for health services, which is very unfortunate. So I also have an example of informal institutions that I want to give. The informal institutions include the norms and the cultures and ethics. Here, I have to say that the highest bar of every society is the ethics. The lowest bar is the law. So nobody should be afraid of the law wherever you find yourself. Because the law says that this is the lowest bar. If you cannot clear it, then you go to jail. Don't kill, don't do this, don't do that. That's what the law says. But if you have ethics, if you have high moral standards, you will not bother with the law. I have stayed in many places in America. I don't even know where the police stations are because I don't care. I always make sure I drive, I have everything that I'm supposed to have. And because of that, I don't have any problem doing that. But those who flaunt the law always get themselves into trouble and you want to avoid that. Well, when we talk about a cognitive part, we are talking about whistleblowers. So let's ask ourselves, when somebody comes to tell you about wrong in our society, how do leaders process it? Are their life threatened? So the Whistleblowers Act is still not developed in Africa where people are afraid to tell about the wrong in our society. We know a lot of people who are doing Yahoo Yahoo, people who are doing uh, scam with their computers, a lot of things that are going on, but are we able to tell? Even as a self, your dad or your mom comes home and buy a new car. You know the salaries that they are getting, there's no way they can buy that new car. Are you bold to ask dad and mom, where did you get the money to ask this, to buy this car? We are not able to do that because it's kind of, don't ask, don't tell. That's how Africans believe. But in the advanced world, no. Your kids will ask you questions. Where did you get the money from? Because they want to know the source. That is the ethical standard that I'm talking about. So I've given you a table here, the degree of formality, the examples, and then the supportive pillars. But note that the regulation is very important. And then when we talk about informal institution, we're talking about the standard. So what is our standard? The poor roads, is that our standards? So we allow our leaders to go with these bad access roads because that is our standard. We allow them to give us bad schools, that's our standard. We allow them to give us hospitals without beds, is that our standards? So the informal institutions that are there, what is the standard and the norms and the culture that we have built for ourselves? And I think that unfortunately, our standard has been very low for our leaders. Because when the snow comes in the advanced world, that very night that is snowing, there are still blades that are shoveling the snows. And it's just done because the next morning, people, even when it's snowing, people are still passing to going to work. So you have to shovel it. In our part of the world, it's different. So we need to raise our standard if we want to get away from it. So what do institutions do? They reduce uncertainty. And that is why institutions are very important. The reason why we keep going for aid is because our system, our economic system is uncertain. It's not stable. And because our institutions have not worked. So when Obama came here and talked about build your institution, building your institution, this is exactly what he was talking about. Then when we talk about institutions, they help in quick decision making. So decision making is really concrete when you have that kind of institutions in place. And it helps for business mapping as well. So institutions constrain the range of acceptable actions. If you have institutions working, you can tell that this is accepted, this is not accepted. And when you reduce uncertainty, you have a lot of things that is going your way. So a lot of economic failures we have is because our system are uncertain and we cannot take a lot of shocks. And once it becomes like that, we know inflation, now you go buy something today, the next day the price is so high because transaction costs has increased. We have a, a guy called Oliver Williamson. He's a Nobel Prize laureate. He said that transaction costs are economic counterpart of friction. So anytime institutions are not working, transaction costs are going to increase. You know, Africa is one of the places that we have over 40%. You have to pay bribe before you start a business. Yes, but you, you, when you start a business in Europe or North America, North America, I'm talking about US and then Canada, you go to one spot and then they will file everything for you before you leave, everything put in an envelope and you're not paying more than $200 and everything is set up for you to start your own business. The cost is cheap because they know that once you start business, you'll be able to employ some people and then government will get taxes from you. So we should not make it difficult for people to even start business. But unfortunately that's what is happening. 
So anytime we have high transaction cost, we have what we call opportunism, which is the act of seeking self-interest with gal. So anytime time there's a high transaction cost, people become opportunist. And when they become opportunist, they think about themselves, not the government. You know the definition of corruption, using public office for private gains. And that is exactly what is happening there. So there's a lot of misleading, cheating, and then confusion in our public system. And that is why uh, when you have just a three block, three classroom block for government, the price is three times higher than an individual will build for the same community. Anytime government have to do something for us, the price is highly inflated. We, our unstable institutional framework is giving us a lot of problem. I've already talked about the costs. Uh, I've already talked about why it's helping our road network to be terrible, our bridges, because the cost of setting up things. So let's say you give a road contract and then the minister is taking 10% bribe. How much is left for that contractor to also get his or her profit? And that is why our institutions are not growing, but they have become static. So most countries are institutional transitions and aid in set transition limit efficiencies and transactional costs. Two core propositions of institution-based view. So two things that comes to play, I'm almost done with my presentation, then uh, I will be done. Leaders and individuals rationally pursue their interests and make choices within the formal and informal constraints. So I've already talked about the formal and then the informal. Now, if you're a leader, you combine the two to make decisions. So you need the formal and the informal, and you combine the two to tell about the behavior that you want to see. But unfortunately, the constraints lead to a very unfair and then failed system because we have not been able to combine the formal and the informal system of our institution. So that gives us a high political risk because of changes that are associated with political electioneering periods. And you can tell from history that anytime there's election in Africa, that is where there's high cost. People are really not stable and they think that a lot of things are gonna happen. So most of even the wars in Africa have come out of electioneering periods. Our economic system has always been weak. We are not a pure economic system. So we are not a market economy and we are also not uh, a mixed economy. So we are not command, we are not market. We are picking picks and business of everywhere and then using them. And the same applies to our constitution. In fact, one of the most terrible things that is happening to us is our constitution. Our constitution are static. Most African constitutions are static. It's one of the institutions that is really killing our development. You know, if you go to America or Europe, they always talk about the First Amendment, the Second Amendment, the Third Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, more than the original law. Why? Because amendments face current problems. We have current problems and we are using laws that were passed about 30, 40, 50 years ago to solve those current problems. It doesn't work that way. So we should be thinking about an amendment that fix our current problems. Unfortunately, our parliaments have not been able to help us in that direction. Also, we have intellectual property such as books and videos and websites that are not protected against the laws. So law is a big money in itself and we have not been able to harness that potential. We have patents, legal rights and inventors of manufacturing that is still having a problem. Africa here employs somebody and the next day the person have set up another business at home, calling your customers to home so that they will give them service at a, at a lower price because we don't have patents and legal rights for inventors and licensing. And then we have copyright issues for authors and publishers. Just watch the streets and you see books, people's books have been so everywhere uh, in the traffic. Piracy is everywhere. So intellectual properties are not protected. And that is a problem. So to stop receiving it, we need economic development. And here the statistics are scary. If you look at the gross national index, uh, income index, you have places where countries are making money. That means if you divide the national output by the number of citizens, everybody thousand in some countries to that. Then a Norwegian who is having a gross national income of 76,000 and somebody from Mozambique who is receiving 110 means that 
the person from Norway is about 770 times smarter and hardworking than the person from Burundi. But that is not how it's supposed to be. And I don't believe that is the case. There's another second argument that the rich countries are endowed with natural resources, but compare the resources of Congo, which is the breadbasket of all natural resources, everything in the world, every natural resource is in the democratic of Congo. But look at the poverty level there. Look at Africa. What resources have not got given to us? So why can't we add value to them? And then we are struggling. If you look at the oil being drilled in Ghana, do you know the percentage Ghana gets? Less than 15%. How come that you have oil in your country? Somebody from Britain and America comes to drill it in your land and you will not even get 15% of it. Not even one fifth of it. They will tell you that we use over $40 billion in exploring the oil. And again, it's about human capital development. We've not developed our human capital. We have all the land that God has given to us. Agriculture is not something Africans can run away from. Belgium has done it, it's helped them. Belgium, the breadbasket of Europe, they took into farming, supplying Europe with food and animal husbandry, and they are making a lot of money from it. So Africa, that is one area that we have comparative advantage, but unfortunately, we are not using it. So what is the way forward? Values in our cultures. Values is everything. Even leadership is not defined as your character in action. So your values shine through in your leadership, and that is very true. So our ethics, our standards, and our principles are low or compromised, and we have to look at that. There's a guy called Hopsis. Uh, he's a cultural expert. He talked about collective programming of the mind. That distinguishes one group from the other. So the collective programming of the white people or talking about the advanced world has been different from the collective programming of us. So fly from Kenya or fly from Ghana, Accra to London, it's six and a half hours and it's a different world. And then you fly back to Africa, it's a different world. Fly from uh, Nigeria or fly from Congo and it's about 10, 10 and a half hours to New York, it's a different world. And you fly back reverse journey and it's a different world. So why have you chosen? To be who we are. It's all about collective programming of our mind. Why we throw, you know, garbage everywhere, why people pee everywhere, why people poop everywhere. It's a collective programming of our mind that this is okay. When in advanced world, it is not okay. So we should be looking at that. So think about the thought, the waste, national issues, corruption, leadership, followership. This is all collective programming. And we should be thinking about our collective programming because that is the culture we have crafted for ourselves. I also talk about language development. So the Japanese speak Japanese language, British, English, Netherlands, Dutch, German, but Africa, we have 3,000 languages out of the 6,000 languages of the world are coming from Africa alone. And I think that we should be able to have a lot of languages. I gave this whole thing about a lady called uh, Mervyn Bragg. She talked about how the English use English language to conquer the world. And I give that as a reference because I'll leave this PowerPoint. And she talked about, that was an intriguing thing that they used to conquer the world as, as a language. You can see that now the Chinese are also helping universities to set up Chinese language, you know, because language is a key area of domineering another culture. And here there's a guy called William Shakespeare, we've all heard about him. He added 2000 words to the English language. So let's develop our language. There are many words in English that are not in our local languages. So let's develop that. It's going to help us. Uh, here, I recommend Kenyans. They have Swahili as a national language. Most African countries don't have a national language. And like I said about Belgium, they have about four to five national languages. We can do the same. You know, not necessarily just one language, but we should allow some of these local languages to blossom because they help us. I'll always tell the story. I was a manager with Pearson in Ohio, and I was in charge of 230 different state board testing. What I saw is that a test like nursing, so you know, medicine, pharmacy, nursing, GRE, GMAT, but a, a test like nursing takes six hours for people to do. So somebody come to do the NCLEX, which is the state test board for nursing. And instead of six hours, after 45 minutes, we, we test your brain. So it's an adaptive test. We ask you a question about anatomy, you answer them, we go to physiology. And then we realize that if you, after 45 minutes, You've answered, let's say, 60 questions. You've got 40 right. Then you know what you're doing. Your screen turned blank, and then you passed. 
After 45 minutes, you've answered 60 questions, you've got 40 wrong and then 20 right. We know we, you don't know what you're doing. Your screen turns blue and then you fail. But most Africans that I observed as a manager there is that they will come and sit after 45 minutes, they've answered 60 questions. You know what? They have got 30 right and then 30 wrong. So the computer adaptive test, we don't know whether they, they, they know what they're doing or they don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they are doing. So we allow them to sit for the entire six hours. That is difficult for somebody to sit for an entire six hours to write a test. But most Africans are upset. That is that. Why? Because they have to read the question in their language, in the English language, interpret it in their national language, their local language, before they can come and answer. It slows them down and it makes them slow in everything that they do. And we all know from psychology that we dream in the native language of our parents. So yes, I understand different languages, but when I dream, I dream in the language of my parents, not in English. And that is why it is important to develop our language. So I've talked about languages that we have in Africa, and then we see that the Chinese, how they're also using language to help. So Chinese is the world most spoken language. You would think it is English, but no, it's, it's Chinese. So look at that. English is a distant second, 6% of the world population. So language development is really key in our world. So by the numbers, I've given the language here and then the sources is nicely cited. So how do we leverage our resources and capabilities? How many minutes do I have left? Five minutes or two minutes? Please moderator, just let me know. You can just come in anytime. How many minutes? Please yeah. go ahead, Prof. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. leveraging our resources and capabilities, what are productive resources? We have the natural resources in abundance. There's nothing wrong with our land. There's nothing wrong with our people. There's nothing wrong with our resources. The only thing we are lacking is exemplary leadership. That's all what is lacking. And when we have the right leaders, they will harness all the resources to maximize the benefit for our society. So how do we deploy all these resources? We have many of them, financial, physical, technological, human, innovation, and their reputational. As Africa, we have a lot of reputation. The problem is that we are proud people. In fact, we, we, we love our culture. We are proud people. Just that we've not been able at the front end to be able to reach where we want to be. And we lack research culture. We all know that culture of research is non-existent in Africa. Our academia is doing well. But unfortunately, like I said earlier, our politicians are not using the right potential of academia, which is unfortunate. Ebola is an example. When Ebola has been in 1957 there from Congo, and yet we never set up a research to find a solution until recently when Ebola came and there were two Americans who had it. They had to come to Emory University. That time I was at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia uh, for a conference of Association of Political Science Professors. And I was at that conference when I saw that guy being brought there. And you know the research that they used in solving the Ebola, it was a blood of a rat that they used in making this preparation for uh, Ebola. And yet it was an African-based disease. Ebola was strictly limited to Africa. And we had not found solution until an American got infested with it. And then they tried to find a solution to Ebola. So let's begin to think about our culture of research, how we can have research to solve African problems. Because you have a lot of people who have PhDs in agricultural science and soil science and other things, but yet they sit at the office and they hardly even roll their sleeves and go to the field and then till the land. So there are a lot of development. You also have electric people who are, don't even know how to do that. I, I think that we should we should be hands on and then be very knowledgeable with the mind instead of just the. Our, our minds are very knowledgeable, but our hands are not able to uh, do that. So research is very important. Then our value chain, you know, our value chain are very weak. Our benchmarking is also very weak. Our resources and capabilities to perform a particular activity in a manner superior to our competitors are weak. We have all the resources. We are the only country that export crude oil in the raw state, and then they can use it for over 18 different uses and bring us just the refined oil. So why can't we refine the oil in our own country, but we export the crude one, and then when they refine, we import that one back. We should be looking at that. So in conclusion, we are people of choice, and we have largely chosen to be where we are with some Western worlds who do not wish us well. 
So that whether we continue to receive aid or not, for our development, the choice is always in our hands. I end by saying that we must be captains of our own souls and heritage. No one can tell our story for us. Posterity is watching us. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Thank you for such solid and enduring observations, excellently presented. For me, uh, the topic on foreign aid still intrigues me because until last year, when I enrolled for the master's program in Salt Institute, I naively thought that donors were very generous, you know, the godly type of generosity, by them granting us a helping hand without any strings attached. Now I know better. Aid indeed does not have any strings attached, but rather ropes, huge ropes attached to every aid granted. Prof, you have touched on why do we need to import food while we can comfortably feed ourselves? Very interesting submission. But what do you have to say on, for example, bilateral agreements and in a simplified manner and uh, taking a very specific example, you know, Pakistan has told Kenya that we, we will drink your tea if you eat our rice, you know, Pakistan rice for Kenyan tea. So how will the Kenyan local rice production be strengthened against these international agreements, for example? Now, let me just pose this question at this juncture. And maybe you can have an opportunity some uh, during the Q and A to maybe just share additional thoughts on this. But for now, please, technical team, may I request you to project the second poll questions? And thank you so much, Prof. We will certainly come back to the Q and A, and I'm sure we'll get some questions um, and some insights from the participants that we would like to engage you further. So please, technical team, kindly. Thank you so much. We have the second poll question. And the question is, how can African governments utilize aid to stimulate economic growth? And you have four options to select from, either invest in te technology infrastructure, develop technical and vocational skills among the youth, strengthen institutional institutions and domestic accountability, or the fourth option is fund social interventions for the marginalized. I urge all to, Quickly, just share your thoughts in less than 60 seconds so that we can have some time dedicated to listening to our, our discussant who is uh, ready to take us through. But kindly, you have an option to share with us your thoughts on how can African governments utilize aid to stimulate economic growth. You have four options to select from. And kindly note that you have a single choice to choose. So just in about 20, 25 seconds, we should have the responses for the outcome of the, of the responses from the participants on how can African governments utilize aid to stimulate economic growth. Having listened to what Prof has said, what in your opinion is a way that African governments can utilize um, aid to stimulate economic growth? So kindly, the technical team, would you please share with us the results from the poll? Thank you so much. And um, we have a majority, um, if I can say it that way, of um, slightly more than half of you thinking that African governments can utilize aid to stimulate economic growth by strengthening institutions and domestic accountability. So slightly more than 30% think that it's through developing technical and vocational skills among the youth. Of course, having looked at the statistics on uh, which countries have um, the highest youth unemployment, which is so scary to think about it. And um, about 10, 13% of you uh, consider investing in technology infrastructure as a, an, a means and a way that African governments utilize aid to stimulate economic growth. Thank you so much for your responses. And I see now that we have our discussant ready to take us through the second part of our session this afternoon, this evening. And now, ladies and gentlemen, let's listen in to insights from our discussant, Dr. Moleko. Please, Dr. Moleko, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine, and a very good evening or good afternoon um, to everyone who's here, to the chairman of Intercessors for Africa, to I'm the chairman of SALT and the trustees who are here in the leadership of the Institute. Uh, my fellow uh, uh, speaker, Professor Enoch Opuku Antui, 
and uh, to the management of the Institute and technical team led by Mr. Michael Amma uh, and Dr. Kofi. A very good afternoon. And more importantly to those who are listening, and thank you so much for joining and supporting today's um, engagement. I'm gonna get right to it and uh, deal with uh, the issues that have been raised um, in today's uh, discussion. And I think my context is really, um, I titled my response to professors' uh, very decisive inputs, uh, Josephic action, Josephic action to end economic slavery. I believe that what we need across the continent is an action similar to that of Joseph's uh, from the book of Genesis. And I cite some examples there from, and I will detail in the presentation uh, what I believe some of the solutions uh, in response to uh, the presentation uh, by Professor uh, Enoch uh, have been. So let me uh, share the presentation and uh, put it up for everyone to see. Uh, if I can just get a confirmation, uh, Catherine, can you can you see the presentation? Yes, we can. If you can only put it on, um, yes, now it's okay. Thank you. All right. So I'll talk uh, a little bit slowly, colleagues, because there are translators who are uh, translating into French and other languages. So you may find, I normally talk quite quickly, but I hope Dr. Kofi, my pace just signaled to me if I'm very fast by just raising your hand like this and I will try to slow down. The first uh, few points raised by uh, Prof Enoch and Tui was that aid and its outcomes have shown us as a continent that we have really been unable to yield economic outcomes that benefit the majority of our people. Uh, we stand now post COVID with over 400 and 65 million Africans in poverty. Uh, this is despite having all the resources that we have. Now, he has pointed out, Professor has stated that we're largely government dependent. He has pointed out that in that context, we have an education system that doesn't necessarily focus on impact. And I concur. Uh, with his com comments and sentiment, uh, Professor Antwi. We have many public goods. I want to even emphasize that the public goods are not for the elite, they're only for the poor. And what you're finding is across the continent that the elite don't use the public goods except if necessary. Majority of them use the private goods, which they don't necessarily uh, see a change of their livelihoods and outcomes of. I concur with his point that is made that free aid is not free. There's no such thing as a developed nation that will assist you as a developing country to develop yourself. And uh, what I would like to add to that is for me, that Josephic action, when I say Josephic action, I'm talking about the man Joseph in the book of Genesis. He was sold <clears throat> as a result of that sale many particularly his brethren thought, his brothers thought that they would be ending and terminating his destiny. Now, that wasn't the case. However, the sale and the underpinning of the sale has many implications for the continent and I'll outline what I mean by that. He used the example of Nigeria and how they have many resources, but despite that the productive capacity doesn't yield to youth employment. And I think this is really the, the, the scene across the board. And this is what we see in most of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, where the youth is not the economically active portion of the population. And the unfortunate issue that we then see is that either the youth is involved in illicit activity in crime, or they are in ships in the Mediterranean Sea trying to get to Italy, trying to get to France, trying to get to America, trying to leave their own native country for better economic opportunities. And uh, this is a problem that can be turned around. And the last point uh, that he has summa summated in the last portion of his presentation was about the management of the economies 
and the use of institutions and regulatory framework. Now, I want to emphasize my point is that what we need to see is a change in the use of institution and the regulatory frameworks so you can service the people. Unless you change the laws, unless you change the frameworks, you are unlikely to see, even with new leaders, change in outcomes. And I will explain that in the presentation in response to Professor Antwi's submission. How do we end this economic slavery? And what do I mean by economic slavery? I want to explain the theory now. This is the continent of Africa. <clears throat> I put it in amidst the continent and the others because I believe that we are a great light and I believe that we will arise and shine for our light has come. I do believe that uh, our best days are before us and I'll explain that. If you look at the map I just showed before, this is the map all of us have been taught in all of our lives. This is the map that you and I picture when we see the size of Africa against all the other continents. But the true map is what I'm going to reflect. If you look at the size of Africa, it has been made smaller than it actually is. I don't know what the reason and who did this, but I know that now when you do look at the evidence and visually how they are showing the size of Africa, in our continent, we can put China, we can put the United States. If you look on the right here, I'm just trying to put a pointer so everyone can follow with me. Look on the right here. The United States can be put in our continent. That's the size of this United States, the square miles, about 30%. The whole of Europe can be put in our continent. This is the size of India in our continent. And you can see China at the bottom there in our continent. Now, if I put all of these countries in the map of Africa, including here, you can see the UK. Can you see that? all of the different countries and the continents of the world, a large proportion of them actually are much smaller than what they have been told to us. We've been taught that we are smaller than all these countries cumulatively in that other map. But if I show you now what is the actual size, you'll be surprised and shocked as I was. So all of this, if I put the facts for those who like numbers, China, the US 32%, China, 31%, India, 10 All of these countries combined, if I add Mexico, Spain, Sweden, Japan, New Zealand, Italy, UK, Greece, they do not amount to more of our land mass as the African continent. They are actually less than 100% of our land mass. Why are they constantly telling, showing us this map? Because if you look at this map, you are smaller than all these countries. Let me show you the real map. Have any of you seen the real map is what you are seeing. I want to show you this again. This is the real truth of the situation. The continent of Sub-Saharan Africa is here. These actual sizes of all these continents, can you see how much smaller they are in true size to the continent of Sub-Saharan Africa? Australia depletes. Europe deplete, Russia deplete, America's deplete, Greenland and all these other nations are much smaller. And this inherently is the issue that we have as a continent. A lot of issues we have is primarily because of misinformation. We have been told not our true size, but I believe is to keep us locked in a wrong mindset and a wrong perception about who the true Africa is. Genesis 37, verse 27. We see here the first issue about slavery in one of the examples of slavery in the Bible. And I'm going to read this scripture. It says, come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. Let not our hand be upon him. He is our brother and our flesh. And his brothers listen. Verse 28. Then Midianite traders passed by. So the brothers pulled Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit. 
and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekel of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. So here we see something about slavery. Here we see something for the first time about a young man named Joseph who had a dream that made his brothers so infuriated that they decided the only way was to kill him. One of the brothers then intervened to say, let's not kill this one. Let's rather just uh, uh, put him in a pit. When he came back, his other brothers decided to sell him. Before he came back, found that they'd sold him and he was devastated, but there was nothing he was able to do at that time, according to him. So Joseph went to Egypt. I want to put a preposition here that says, giving development aid to a slave is immaterial. That slave remain in chains. We cannot give aid to African nations who remain in slavery because that aid is not going to help us if we are in chains to get out of the chains. What we need is to get out of the chains. What are those chains? In Genesis 37, what we see there is that the brothers made an agreement. An agreement is always made when a destiny is altered. Irrespective of the humanity of that individual, you will see that there is a sale that is made. And that is what we see in the continent. Irrespective of our humanity as a people and our likeness to other people, it doesn't change the fact that individuals have made agreements concerning the destiny of the continent of Africa. You may even think that you are being lifted out of a pit, but you may find that being lifted out of that pit by those very individuals is actually into a far worse disposition and into slavery. Why is a sale something that I'm focusing on? I'm focusing on the issue of a sale in the context of our economy because what sales do, if they are motivated by withholding you from your destiny, is that they ensure that you are enslaved and they ensure that you remain in a state where you are not free to fully see the benefit of what you have been put and given according to God as, a, as your destiny. In verses 23 and verse three of that very same chapter, you can read it for yourself. We see there, it says that Joseph was given a tunic or a coat of many colors, which they stripped him off. We also see that it was his father in verse three who gave him the coat of many colors. So Joseph did not give himself the destiny. Joseph did not give himself the calling or the accolade that he had. It was his father. And I think similar to Joseph, we as Africans did not give ourselves the resources, the mineral wealth, the disposition that we have. It was our father who has given us all of this mineral wealth. And in that process, because of the things that have happened upon, upon the continent, I believe that we have been stripped through the legal laws and some of the 1885 Declaration of Berlin or the Berlin Conference of the very resources we were given. And I believe we have yet to see the fullness of that benefit. The coat of many colors speaks of the dream and the destiny upon the life and the continent of Africa that God has. It speaks of the purpose that Joseph carried and the purpose for which he's put Africa on this uh, continent and nations in. It speaks of the dreams that he has for the continent and the man. And remember, the destiny is given to a person or a continent, not by man, but by God. So we see here that here is the coat of many colors. God has given Africa iron ore, gold, crude oil, diamonds, timber, cocoa beans was used by Prof. Antwi in the value chain of cocoa and chocolate manufacturing, aluminum, fish, gold, platinum or the platinum's group, copper and petroleum and oil being one of those. There are various other, I believe, coats that were been given in terms of resources but this is something that we were given natural produce, cotton by God and not of man, which Africa 
is seeing constantly uh, being taken and not benefiting from. Why was the sale taking place? Why was it necessary to sell Joseph in terms of uh, his destiny and to try to alter the destiny? We see that sales is not new with Joseph. Sale is something that occurred throughout the Bible and we see to alter destiny, Judas sold himself and he sold Jesus Christ in Matthew 26, 14. He offered and he said, what are you willing to give me if I deliver Christ to you? And they counted him 30 pieces of silver. There was a sale made. We see Delilah sold Samson to the Philistines with 10 shekels of silver. That was a, uh, a, a, with 1,100 shekels of silver. 10 shekels of silver was a year's wages. So you saw here that the Philistines were willing to pay a lot of money to ensure the destiny of Samson was changed. It was very important to them if you go and read Judges chapter 16, verse five. The sale is to alter a destiny. We see sales across the continent. The sale also maintained deception for generations. I showed you just one example. There are many things I could have shown you, but time is not on our side. I showed you the deception of how we have been made smaller across the continent in just in terms of size. If they can do that with size, how many other things can be maintained with deception? Soldiers misled the nations in Matthew 18 with money. Money was used, it says there that when they were going, behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priest all things that had happened. When they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the, to the soldiers saying, tell them his disciples came at night and stole him away while we slept. We know now that many of the people that heard this lie from the soldiers believed the lie. They believed that he was stolen, and this was Christ. This is after his rising. They wanted to mislead the nation for generation because of a sale. And you see in 1 Timothy 6, 10, many of the issues of bribery, corruption, misuse of our resources come from the love of money. And the love of money, it says in 1 Timothy 6, the love of money is a root of all kind of evil. And so we see all manner and form of evil, which we can spend a decade discussing. But that sale establishes deception. It is also to enforce a systemic slavery. I believe that just like Joseph, who was bought by Potiphar in the book of, uh, in the book of Genesis, uh, we see that Joseph, as he was taken down to Egypt, he was purchased by Pharaoh, who was the captain of the guard. But it says that the Lord was with Joseph and he was a successful man and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Now, that enforcement of systemic slavery, it shows you here that despite the fact that Joseph was successful, he was still a slave. It shows that despite the fact that he was now the ownership and the property of another, he was able to still be in a house under a master and be given some kind of, uh, I'd say, authority and function. So you can still be, even as a nation, successful to some degree, but you are under the property and ownership of another. You can even find favor, but you are still a slave. As long as you have a master, whereby you are expected to adhere to certain prescripts and do what you are told, you remain a slave. The benefits of everything that you are given, you remain a slave. So slaves are the property of someone else, you're not free. What we find generally is that they are premised on legal ownership of persons and all your benefits of your skills and your resources accrue to that owner. Slaves, if not obedient to their masters are punished. Some are killed, some are tortured, some are executed. In fact, to a large extent, humanity was built on slavery. The Romans had slaves, the Greeks had slaves. Much of Europe and Americas were built on the back of 
West African slavery. And we see that this was abolished only in the last 50 to 100 years. Slaves, and I believe slavery is also systemic. We focus on the slavery of a man, but I believe many of our economic systems have sophisticated ways of keeping us enslaved. You can be a slave, but you can be skilled. In the, mod, in the olden times, you had skilled slaves, you had unskilled slaves. You also have a sophisticated legal system that makes it acceptable, that enables you to have laws and rights that enforces even these contracts and slavery so that should you want to get out, you are unable. So you found that legal obligations were developed by senates that have judicial power to enforce this slavery. I believe it's the same with economic slavery and senates even judicial powers are given to institutions and entities to ensure that you are retained as a country in slavery. The fourth point is that they establish grounds for imprisonment if you are disobedient. If you are disobedient, should you refuse to oblige, we see there that you can be thrown from slavery to imprisonment. Genesis 40, 20 shows you once the wife of Potiphar was refused the sexual uh, favors that she sought from Joseph, Joseph's master took him, put him into the prison upon hearing of the allegations without testing them from the wife. This is now where he entered prison. But again, as a slave to a prisoner, the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord showed him mercy. The Lord gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Even there, you can have favor even as a prisoner. You can have mercy even as a prisoner. But what it means is that you are always at the, at the mercy of your master. Your freedoms are stripped. Someone is determining and controlling what you do, what you eat, how you sleep, and pretty much you can put it at a national level as to what are the liberties of a nation. If a nation is really sovereign, should you not be deciding your laws? Should you not be deciding how you benefit from your resources? Should you not be deciding how you run your affairs as a country? If you are a prisoner or a slave, you generally, even if you put a new, I'd say political party or a political authority in place, you may find you have difficulty changing those fundamental laws because you are actually a prisoner who is given favors. So these are some of the things we need to look out for, but I will go to the economics now, um, having set the, the tone. I believe some of the issues uh, that are keeping us enslaved, debt obligation. It was first the structural adjustment program, now is Chinese debt. It is the long-standing economic colonial bonds. I won't go into the detail of some of these agreements, Aid is here as one of them. There's conventions, the Lomé, the Cotonou partnership. There's a lot of trade agreements, Europe and the, with the Europe and the global North that make easy movement of our goods to them. You find to change these agreements, to, 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 to change the terms of these agreements, to look at who are the beneficiaries of these agreements is actually usually not African. There's a duty-free exports from Africa, usually to the EU. And you'll find all of these agreements are generally not to the benefit, the large majority of them of Africa to the extent that they should. There's an issue of illicit financial flows. I won't talk to the extent, each country has different numbers, but you find that multinationals are the beneficiaries of many of our trade agreements and they are the ones who export most of our resources. They exploit international tax systems. A lot of research has shown that they trade with subsidiaries where they then put the money in the tax haven through the subsidiary. Shifting of profits occurs. Once you need to tax these companies in the home country where the actual economic activity happens they have shifted the profit to another part of the world where there's a tax haven and you can no longer tax. So these are part and parcel 
of some of the issues that anyone on the economic mountain who is trying to get the benefit of the resources to the people should be dealing with these issues. If you don't deal with these issues, it's likely that you are just getting some of the favors, but you remain either in prison or in a state of slavery because you cannot benefit uh, from the agreements and the resources that you have. I've also put here, you can share the presentation, Dr. Kofi, with the participants. The levels of debt are scary. Most of the European countries upon COVID-19, they did not borrow money. They actually did what is called quantitative easing and they raised financial resources through zero interest free loans from their reserve banks. Africa, on the other hand, was told they needed 154 billion US dollar to finance some of the fiscal, uh, fiscal responses because of the reduction in expenditure and revenue that they were, reduction in revenue collection. What we then end up is many countries are in distress, there's more money being borrowed, and you're finding that the median public debt level has risen from almost 31 to 53%, and even worse now, there's a trend where you're finding over $30 billion owed to Chinese creditors by 2021. And a tenth of these was to Chinese Development Bank alone. How do we break these chains, Saints? What is necessary to be done to break these chains? The first point is to understand the coat of many colors that we have been given, it remains. We have the largest reserves of oil and gas. We have the largest reserves of cobalt. We as Africa have soda ash, zirconium, phosphate rock, vermiculite, manganese. These are resources that the Lord has given us that we are expected to use for our own economic development. Up to 57% of global diamonds are here. Chromite, of, of half of that is here. Gold, 19%, uranium, and so forth. These are significant resources that are mounting. But who do the benefits go to? Because what you sell is what you are able to make use of for the, for the benefit of your people. Mainly what you're finding is that the beneficiaries are your large multinationals and corporations who receive mining licenses, concessions, and are able to extract those resources or process some of them from the African continent. There's a heavy reliance in most of our economies which enforces that enslavement of mineral exports of raw goods. If we are to break the chain of slavery, we have to exit the trap of being a mineral export led country revenue generation. We cannot continue to export like what was agreed in 1885 at the Berlin Conference, even in 2022. The economic blueprint has to look at, particularly with mining and the gains of mining, how to derive the resource model that will benefit the community, that will benefit the miners, and that will unleash economic development from the gains. What you currently see, we give most of our minerals to the Chinese. They come, they may be mineral rich. China has a lot of aluminum and cement and gold and iron, but not enough. The demand they have exceeds supply. What you have seen in the last decade, 21 mining bureaus have been set up on the continent specifically to deal with mining. This is the coat of many colors. All the investment in infrastructure and a large proportion has been geared towards extracting the mineral resources, moving the mineral resources, setting up the logistics framework to move your gas, your oil, and your minerals outside of your countries. Not to retain, not to beneficiate, not to process it, but rather to export you'll find that there's a focus on countries such as Liberia, Eritrea, Guinea now, DRC, Sierra Leone, Zambia, Namibia, and even South Africa, amongst others, by the Chinese. And 80% of the 
of what they import from us, i.e. what we export are these minerals to China, raw, raw minerals, unprocessed, unbeneficiated, and not taken to the next level. I want to share this video with you, and it's a slight uh, deviation. Let me see if it's going to play. If it doesn't play, I'll just continue. Yes, it's playing. Dr. Moloko, please share audio. Can you hear me? The video does not have audio. Okay, let me leave it because it will delay us. I will just share the link uh, for the video, Bernard, so that I don't, oh, I didn't share the sound. It will play now. You should be able to hear now. The Simandu mountain range in the West African nation of Guinea is one of the world's most biologically rich ecosystems. It's also probably the largest untapped iron ore deposit on the planet. An estimated 8.6 billion metric tons of iron is buried there. That's enough to build more than 100,000 Empire State buildings. Plans to extract the material have been in the works for decades, and now a Chinese-backed consortium of companies is moving ahead with the project. The environmental impacts could be devastating. This is my fifth trip to Guinea and um, coming here to monitor Chinese mining corporations, uh, environment and human rights performance. Jing Jing Jiang is a Washington-based lawyer I traveled with who's working with other NGOs in the area. We talk with local people and local government officials about their lands and their water and uh, the wild animals and their future. She's been called the Aaron Brockovich of China for winning the first large class action environmental lawsuit in that country. I have a, a reasonable doubts of this company and uh, its operation here because of his environment performance in the bauxite mining region. The consortium that will mine Simandu is already mining bauxite used to make aluminum in Guinea's bouquet region. I know the way this company is working. And Bokeh. Bokeh is about a six hour drive north of Guinea's capital, Conakry. Being there, the first thing you notice is the dust. It's everywhere in your hair, in your eyes, and all over the crops people are trying to grow. Water sources have been polluted, fishing stocks have declined, and jobs promised to the community have yet to materialize in any large number. L'eau, c'est la vie. Aujourd'hui, beaucoup de cours d'eau sont pollués et les communautés n'ont plus accès à l'eau potable. La poussière causée par les camions qui passent sur les routes minières ont suscité des maladies respiratoires chez les communautés. Back in Simandu, Chinese workers have set up a gated camp near the village of Damaro. The peaks here contain as much as 65% iron, which according to experts, is the highest grade possible in nature. This is a huge pro project. It's one of the biggest in Africa. Environmentalists are concerned that what happened in Bokeh will happen again in Simandu. The worst impact would be destruction of the farm surrounding the mountain. There are many villages living from the farm, from the lands. If they lose the land, all these people will, will be in poverty. The point I wanted to make in the video has been made, and that is the way in which we allow for our minerals to be exported, whether it's by the Chinese, whether it's by the Europeans, it appears that the actual model for extraction remains. Our people 
are non-entities. Villages are usually disbanded in the process and extraction is the heart and at the heart of what our economic models are actually establishing. So you see the same with Europe since the 1800s, precious metals are then used to produce everything extracted the goods that you see in Guinea that will be extracted from those mountains that may displace those people in those villages, they will not see the benefits of any of those goods. And you'll find that the roads, the schooling, the conditions of the livelihoods of the people there is actually worse than areas where there is no mineral resource. Cars are made from the goods extracted, windmills, kitchen equipment, computers, all the electrical devices we are using, even to watch this uh, seminar and this uh, public lecture is from goods extracted from one of our countries used by countries that later beneficiate and also process it to make value added goods. Our problem is not the issue of having resources, but is the economic models that we have had with our trading partners, whether it's the Europeans, the Chinese or any other partner that we would have in trade. We are rich as Africans. We are wealthy and you see here, and this graph shows you how wealthy we are in terms of the goods that we use. I won't focus on the level of export to imports, but what we know is that we have a very low margin that we gain from processing most of these goods. They are unmanufactured. The result then is the least developed countries, despite having the most of the resources are in Africa. 70% are in Sub-Saharan Africa. And you see here that despite our resources, because of the economic slavery and the trade agreements and the manner that our institutions do not change those and continue and simply allow extracting from a different master, we will then remain with the problems. Josephic interventions are therefore required. What are those Josephic interventions? My belief is we have to change the legal standing of these colonial economic bonds. If new leaders come in and simply maintain them, they will not be changed. If new political parties come and take power, but they don't change the legal standing of colonial economic bonds, you are not going to see change. Therefore, you've got to investigate what are the laws that are causing you to in state to, 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 to keep these extraction, which has been modeled in 1885 and amend them. These are usually your mining laws. These are usually your taxation laws. These are usually your concessionary laws. These are usually how your treasury enables for new firms to be established and local firms to be beneficiators and part of the value chain and looking at systems for exporting that enable local export and reduce importing of your goods. So these bilateral agreements that force you to import basic foodstuffs, you've got to review those. These laws that enable slavery from an economic perspective, whereby you have no freedom to benefit from the very resources and the coat of many colors you have. You've got to review those. Unless you do not conform and break them, you will remain in the economic bondage of Joseph and you will never be freed. What this means is that there's a, there's a, there's a natural level of abolishing legal prescripts but there is a spiritual element of abolishing the altars and the covenants that kept us in bondage. I believe that these spiritual elements cannot be missed. Many political parties come in and they simply focus on the natural laws without focusing on the spiritual dimension. Every nation needs to look and deal with the altars and the covenants that keep us in bondage and break those so that you can also see the liberties at a natural level so that you can see the resources for all. The Moses, the Daniels, the Davids and the Josephs need to understand institutions have to be redeemed. 
institutions have to be redeemed. You see da Daniel and Joseph and David in the Bible give various examples of how they inst redeemed institutions by redeeming firstly worship. They redeemed firstly worship. They redeemed the altar of worship. They redeemed the institutions to function optimally and they ensured that the resources benefited most of the people. I should have added Nehemiah and Deborah here. You have to forgive the seller who's established the system. Joseph is the example. His brothers sold him and you see in Genesis 45, he had to later forgive his own brothers who exchanged him. Joseph's solution in Genesis 47 in dismantling uh, the slavery, once he was freed, he was freed. You must note that in Genesis 46, we see and Genesis 45, we see how he was uh, freed. He then put in place a process of how to give bread in exchange for other goods. There's trade that happens, but when you trade and you're in a position of slavery or imprisonment, you at a disadvantage. So what this means is that we have to come out of that place of imprisonment and slavery so that we are not at a disadvantage when we are now trading and setting laws and agreements. These are the agreements that we need to now have so that we can exchange our goods freely and make sure that we benefit as much as those who get the benefit of our goods. Production and self-sustenance is key. We cannot rely on imports. You see in Genesis, Joseph says to the people, indeed, I have bought you and your land this day for Pharaoh. But look, here is seed for you and you shall sow the land. We have to marry the land as Africans. We have to go back to self-sustenance and production. The point Kathy made about the, I don't know what country it was that wants to enforce a type of agreement that makes you not sustenance, have self-sustenance for me is a clear example whereby you are being hedged into an agreement that in the long run may be to your disadvantage. What you see is that the church has to actively produce Josephs who are seeking national transformation to build, to produce and to raise the family mountain. If you don't build and produce and raise the family mountain, that national transformation may not come forth. And very importantly, I believe God will deliver us, but there is an action that is necessary from us as Africans. So we see the resources, we see how much wealth we have. We see that from the Berlin conference, it's pretty much, it's still in place where you see even in Exodus one to three, after Joseph delivered the Israelites, they were put back in slavery by the Egyptians who saw how prosperous they were. Africa before 1885 was very prosperous. We had uh, kingdoms, we had trade from the Horn of Africa to West Africa to the great Zimbabwe's in Southern Africa. But there came a time when the Egyptians came and saw our wealth, our abundance, our multiplication and said, no, we've got to deal with these ones. And I believe everything changed in 1885. And as we see the extraction continuing, where we own cobalt, 53%, uranium, 16%, diamonds, 22% from Botswana, Niger, Namibia, Guinea, we see Demo Democratic Republic of Congo with 53% of cobalt, which makes our laptops, our, our, our cell phones, industrial diamonds, uh, platinum, 77% from South Africa, chromite. These are all the inputs that we should be exchanging fairly so that we derive the benefits. God has given us these resources. We cannot stay enslaved and in bondage without being allowed to use these resources to benefit from them. Oil exports alone in Angolia, Nigeria, over $170 billion, but you're not able to gain all the gains from them because of illicit financial flows. DRC alone in one year lost almost 1.36 billion because of illicit financial flows, which I explained. So we need to trust the Lord, Exodus six. He says, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. We need to be brought out from under the burden of the Egyptians. 
I will rescue you from their bondage and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. My belief is that the Moseses of our generation will be raised up and the Lord will use them as they rely on him to bring us out. Because many of these agreements, these partnerships, these unilateral, multilateral agreements are not easy to simply exit from because you may remember what a master does to a slave when trying to exit tortured, execution, even death. But we trust that the Lord, he himself will protect us and enable us to exit the bondage that we have entered into. My two last slides speak about what I believe the strategic interventions ought to be once we enter into dealing with those altars, those covenants, those agreements. We've got to use agriculture as a basis for manufacturing. Joseph's need to be raised up in every nation with or without government aid. The church should be the first advocate for agriculture as a basis for development. All these subsectors that are here, we can produce. We need to start having infant industries and not be scared to start developing from small manufacturing outlets, small mini industries where we are self-sustainable as communities. Yes, they will be demand driven. Energy efficiency is a new thing. We can do that, mechanize and look at how best, what models can be put in place. But these are the things that we need to put in place that will create youth development, that will enable job creation and that will buttress self-sufficiency. We've got to do these things by developing our rural areas and localizing very basically our food production. In order for us, I want to skip these two, three slides and go to the conclusion um, and end with the Isaiah 60 and Isaiah 61 and start and declare over the continent that Africa arise and shine for your light has come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Behold, darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness the people, but the Lord will arise over you and his glory shall be seen upon you. Gentiles shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. And what we need is the Joseph or the Josephic interventions that will rebuild the old ruins. They will raise up the former desolations. They will repair the ruined cities and the desolation of many generations by industrializing, by rebuilding institutions and our macro policy instruments to help us to industrialize to help us to adopt labor absorbing strategies, to help us boost food production and rural development. And lastly, we do not necessarily have to borrow. What we need to do is use our tax agencies, deal with illicit financial flows, use our resource of surplus pension funds, particularly in developed capital markets and use your domestic resources and make sure the private sector participates in ways that will build the desolation of many generations. I want to thank you. And I know I went over my time, uh, Kathy, but thank you so much for allowing me. Thank you, Dr. Moleko. Always exciting listening to your thoughts, your comments, your answers to pertinent questions that I was posting. Very insightful. And I very much like, you know, Africa, the coat of many colors. I also want to just highlight the proposition of domestic food production. You know, allow me to quote also Thomas Sankara, he who feeds you controls you, food for thought. And now I know that uh, we are conscious of the time and we truly apologize that we've gone over, uh, but it was very interesting to listen to both our keynote speaker and our respondent. And uh, please technical team, uh, kindly project the third poll question, we take it, and then we'll try to compress the remaining part of the agenda so that we finish in the next couple of few minutes. So please, technical team, if you could kindly project the third poll question, we'd like to take that, thank you. The third uh, question that we would like to hear the insights or the opinion of the participants is what do you consider the most significant adverse effect of aid on Africa's economies? Is it distortion of economic development process? hinders economic and investment growth, 
promotion of inefficiency in government or catalyzing the vicious cycle of corruption. Kindly just run and select one choice and then we have 30 seconds for this, make it quick. I'm sure by now, having listened to our keynote speaker and our discussant, our respondents, you already have a clear mind of what you consider the most significant adverse effect of aid on Africa's, on African economies. So kindly quickly uh, respond to that. And then in the next 10, 15 seconds, uh, the technical team should share with us the results. So please technical team, if you could kindly share with us the results from the poll question. Thank you. And thank you to all the participants for actively still being uh, engaged in the discussion. And I see that um, half or rather 30% of you consider two points or two responses as uh, the most significant adverse effects of aid on Africa's economies and that distortion of economic development process and catalyzing the vicious cycle of corruption. And then shortly followed by hinders, hinders economic and investment growth. And um, a handful of you, uh, around 15% consider promotion of inefficiency in government as the most significant adverse effect of aid on African economies. Thank you so much for your engagement. And um, we will hopefully have a few minutes to just further engage you with a and a shortly. But before then, I would like the technical team to also just share with us the promotional video for the Intercessors for Africa Foundation. If you could kindly just share with us that. It is a few minutes video that um, would like to we would like to share with the participants um, for you to understand or to see where the intercessors for Africa vision and mi mission lies. So kindly, the technical team, please share with us that educational foundation video. And once the technical team is setting the scene. Um, Dr. Kofi, my co-host, will come in right after that um, so that we can wrap it up. Thank you, Nicholas. I see the screen, so I keep quiet and then we listen in. Welcome to Sandalos Advanced Leadership Training Institute. This institute was established in 2003 with a commitment to raising, training, and developing seventh leaders for business and public life in Africa, as well as for the global marketplace. The founding organization of the SALT Institute, Intercessors for Africa, had been praying for several years that God would bring change to our dear continent, Africa. In 1997, during a time of waiting on the Lord in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, before a prayer conference, the Lord told one of our leaders that prayer alone by itself could not solve the myriad of challenges confronting Africa. We must take action to train and equip the leaders who will bring about the desired transformation in the continent. The Sandalus Advanced Leadership Training Institute, SALT Institute, is a response to that divine call. SALT Institute is accredited to run academic programs, including Master of Arts in Leadership and Management, Master of Arts in International Relations and Diplomacy, Bachelor of Arts in Transformational Leadership, and Bachelor of Arts in International Relations, and a host of new programs which are soon to be introduced. We have satellite campuses dotted across Africa, and some of our students are even outside the continent because of our blended model of in-person and online learning. Our programs are tailored for the needs of the modern day students. We have a big vision to raise seventh leaders for Africa to transform the continent. And for us to be able to achieve this, we have set up an educational fund that seeks to raise 10 million US dollars to finance current and future projects. The current project we are working on is the construction of a new campus in Accra, Ghana, 
This will be our permanent campus, uh, which will be a world-class environment for academic learning. The Educational Fund will, among others, support the establishment of a scholarship scheme to needy students with great potential to be trained as servant leaders for Africa. The construction of a state-of-the-art library and research centre. To contribute to our education fund, such as the construction of a state-of-the-art campus facility, you can commit to a monthly, quarterly or yearly donation plan of any amount, or sponsor a student to study at the Salt Institute, or become a fundraiser connecting the institute to philanthropic individuals and organizations. SALT Institute is changing the narrative on Africa. SALT Institute is the newest destination for top-notch education in Africa. We are counting on your support to make this vision a reality. God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine, and thank you all for your patience, and thank you for uh, being part of this very uh, insightful and inspirational, uh, you know, knowledge sharing reflections about where we move from here after six decades of uh, aid that has not delivered the right impact. I, I can I can understand the feeling that most of us have now, and asking ourselves, what is the alternative? What do we do? Um, we are not generating enough internally to support our development efforts. And we are saying that the help we have received abroad also has not helped. So are we between the stone and the hard place? What are the choices? A lot of insight has been shared by the uh, um, panelists, uh, Professor Vuguanchi and Dr. Moleko, very, very powerful uh, sense of uh, how this unfolds in our own lives. What I want us to do now uh, is to take a few questions from the participants. We have one uh, that was directed to Professor Pukwanchi. Uh, it's a quite a very loaded one and I can appreciate the source of the question being a Ghanaian following the Ghanaian scene very closely. It says that President Kufuado has a brilliant idea of making Ghana financially independent and was applauded for it. Why do you think Ghana without it didn't work? What advice will you give the government of Ghana at this critical point? Can you share any ideas of what we could have done instead of going to the IMF? Prof, um, that is the question we have in the Q&A room, but I want to call on all participants, please, you can type your questions right in the Q&A room and our panelists will address them. Thank you, Prof, you have the floor. Yes, thank you. The president did not commit to his mantra. If, like I said, if you want to live beyond aid, then you should prepare yourself. That, that aid, you will survive. But every 15 minutes you see uh, aid cars from you know, the Danish government, the American government, JICA, Japan, Everywhere they are helping you. And you say that you don't need their aid, but you are not also not helping yourself so that your people will not need the aid. It's, it's all in the economic front. You know, we've, we've not been able to look at our city now. So the president did not commit to that mantra of living beyond aid. The advice I will give to the government is that in policy formulation and policy implementation, they should, they should cut corruption. A lot of money goes waste. I told you about, if you go to the ministry, I've been to Ministry of Education, uh, Ministry of Health, the very budget from Ghana government, government of Ghana is not coming. So those are the ministries and agencies depend on these aid, the same aid people to get funds for their activities. And how do you say you don't need them when they are financing the very department and agencies that you have in your country? So, it's just a saying, he did not walk the talk. Wow. So, um, um, Dr. Kula, your question is quite insightful and uh, 
uh, uh, insightful public lecture, how do we inspire action to realization? I think I will ask um, both Prof and Dr. Moleku to respond. Uh, maybe Dr. Moleku, if you go first, uh, how do we inspire action? Um, Salt Institute, we want to, we don't want to make these public lectures another talk shop. We want it to reflect in our daily choices as a people to improve the situation. So how do we inspire action? Uh, uh, Dr. Moleko, if you can go first and then Prof can follow. Thanks, Dr. Kofi. Um, I think the first is we must accept that um, if you don't understand the problem, you will then act in the context of the bondages and the laws and the agreements that we have. And it doesn't matter how much you work, it's not going to yield outcomes. So the first thing is the government mountain, the mountain of government or the sphere of government. My wish is that all of the governments of Africa could understand and trace what is it that causes them to not benefit? We are usually told that it's corruption. And I, if I could show a slide here on the proportion of our economies that have gained from aid. Aid is less than 2% of our gross national income or even what I would call our GD, GDPs. Mm -hmm. If you look at a uh, proportion of aid that has been given uh, mm -hmm. to African economies over the last uh, two, three, four, five decades is inconsequential. But the discourse you'll find, the discourse is made that we must now be discussing aid as though it's the driver for economic development. Aid is not a driver for economic development. Usually the different type of aid that is given, bilateral or multilateral in-kind aid, is really project-based. And usually there's conditions that sometimes say you must use consultants organizations from the donor country. So the recipient country is not the main beneficiary. In fact, the main beneficiary sometimes is the donor country and its firms. So you then detail and you look at actually the detail of this age doesn't even benefit the local country. Now, what I wanted to, what, what I wanted to, to deal with is, a, is, is the issue that now you've asked what must be done. So the first thing is we've got to stop looking at aid as the solution for a panacea of our problem. The problems we have on the continent, I believe is some of the issues that we have raised, but there's a definite issue around leadership. If our leaders understood what are those agreements, what are those covenants, what are those debt, what are those things that we are doing that are instituting and continue systemically to drive us towards poverty, to drive us into dependence, to drive us away from self-sustenance. That mountain of government, that mountain that makes the laws that enable us to do trade and enter into create trade agreement, don't take lightly those agreements and those trade laws and those trade policies and what they force you to give away as a country. Very importantly, there's that level of government and that legislative mountain that you, I would hope even SALT Institute and other institutes begin to educate our leaders, begin to educate our people. And maybe they know what they're doing and they're doing it purposefully. Maybe they don't know what they're doing and they're not aware of the type of agreements and what beneficial agreements need to be put in place. But you've got to now start establishing alternative agreements, laws put in place. How do I attract FDI that is beneficial? What is the model FDI? What is the model extraction? What is the model for mining? What is the model for just mining and for a foreign direct investment, particularly when you're dealing with resources? We've seen the model in Botswana, where we've seen a joint partnership between the bank, the state, and the multinational. That model is frowned upon. That model has helped Botswana to develop the diamond industry. But not only that, they share the benefits of extraction with the company that is extracting. Is that the best model? Are there better models? And that is what we need to 
really look at, I think the second question that Mr. Kiula is asking about the, the, the action to realization, I believe that the church has a role. I believe that with the land and the resources in the church, the Josephs should be coming from the body of Christ. The Josephs that will come with the solutions, whether you are using the resources of the government, whether you're using endowment funds, whether you're trusting God, but the people that should be implementing an alternative solution. What I've read in the Bible is that God relied on the people that he himself could lead by his spirit. So you see there that Mishael, Hananiah, Azariah. You see there that, that Daniel. You see there Esther. You see there, there that uh, the people that God would put his spirit upon are the people who would carry the solution. Now, if you and I are not willing to implement anything, that is the problem. What are you implementing? So when we're talking about action, does it mean you need to be in government? Absolutely not. Government has a role to play. And I've explained the mountain of government. Very importantly, it has a role to play. But also as an individual, as the body of Christ, even as a ministry, how are we effectively helping our people action some of the solutions? How are we enabling them to have time to action some of the solutions? And I think that's the culture that we need to move towards where we enable action and we also as individuals and citizens take responsibility and not always play the blame game towards government. I'll stop there, Dr. Kofi. Yes, sir. thank you very much. Um, okay, Prof. I wanna uh, ask you think, uh, to what she said. She's taking yes. the whole thing from the religious perspective. I think uh, we can handle this from different fronts. And I have to apologize when I saw your comment that I talk very fast. <laughs> The issue is that are we aware of our situation? So start from the awareness. Where? For the front end. Any white person come to your house, they look at the bathroom first, your front desk first. Why? Because that, that is what the, that is what creates impression. So are we aware of who we are becoming? I don't think the leaders are aware. I don't think the followers are aware. God has done his part. In fact, I'm, I'm surprised that we keep going to God for all the resources that he's given to us and keep praying. Americans pray, the Japanese pray. People, you know, in the beginning, the darkness and light were together and God separated the two. We've had a series of prophets who claim that they will lead us to the light. You see? Have we lost prof? Series of prophets. We say that they will lead us to people trying to because of doctor. Am I on? Yes, you are on. Okay. So my point here is that are we aware? So there have been mental blocks. The first mental block is that we have failed to see our situation. The second one is that we have failed to move in solving that situation. And that is why we come to the third mental block. We have failed to cross the finishing line. So we have failed to see our problem. Even God who created us do not interfere in our choices. It's a choice. And I have to be blunt here. If we want to solve our problem, the action is that Yeah, Prof, your your You have your chosen is, to be stupid. Excuse my word. Your line is I unstable. have attended many conferences. Can you hear me now? Yeah, your line is quite unstable. You, you keep going off. Oh, okay. It's the internet. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay. So I have attended many conferences where people would tell me that Africa is a dark continent. And I would tell them that, no, we are not a dark continent. We are this. And I was playing all that we do in Africa without us, the rest of the world will not survive. And you know what they would tell me? You need to tell your own stories because we will not tell African stories for you. So yeah, we have to tell our own stories and everything rests on leadership. When Hugo Chavez came to Venezuela, he decided that, look, the oil that you guys are taking away from us I'm 
contracts you have is terrible. It's 50 50. I'm going to make oil price that he said they leave. So she talked about contracts, she talked about debt obligations, she talked about trade agreement, she talked about all those. We have allowed it. We have allowed it. It is our resources. How do somebody come and create a slave mentality for you? Yes, if you come to America, there's something that I'm now sending to court, which is interesting. There are 100 questions that somebody have to answer before you become a citizen of America. And one of the questions is, which people came here as slaves? The answer is Blacks. And I ask that this is racist and stereotyping. Why have you guys allowed this for a long time? Because they, have, they are not aware. They are not aware. And Glenn Sunshine have a book, Why You Think the Way You Do. A lot of things we do have been shaped for us by the Western world. Because American population is just 4% of the world population, but they consume 20% of the world resources, one fifth of it. So without us, they cannot survive. So what are they doing? They are using their brains. So why can't we use ours? Fortunately, we have all the resources. And now you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You don't have to go and create anything. People are using models. So look at the models of their schools. Use your resources, get the same model here. Models of their hospital, get the same here. Even the money you get from the IMF, you can use it to build good hospitals and good schools. But where does the money go? So I am tired of always as, you know, blaming others. Yes, somebody don't wish us well. I talk about Mandela. It's not every country, and there has never been a developed world trying to have a developing country. So every country that comes to have contracts with us, they have their interest. They will always have their interest, but what is our interest? It's our interest for our people of our own pockets and the pockets of our families. Let's think about that. Because I think that the other action is that we don't have national development plans. So this government comes, do a bit, leaves it, the other one will come and not continue. And then we have a lot of projects that are ghost projects. We don't do schedule maintenance. So there are a lot of things we need to do for ourselves. I want us to look within ourselves and solve our problems as cause of action. Let's leave the others because we have the resources. We need the leaders who put their resources to good use so that we can benefit from our own resources. That's my submission. Yeah, thank you very much, Prof. Uh, very passionate response. Uh, I can understand um, your point of pain. Uh, we have so much overrun the time that uh, we are unfair to our audience. However, for the sake of uh, uh, some of the pertinent questions, I want to read just two, and I will kindly play with our panelists to just take a minute each for reflection. Uh, the conversation does not stop after this. We may not be able to uh, go into each detail at this uh, meeting, but there is opportunity to do all of that uh, after this session. But the one question that I that is on the line as a way forward, would an approach be totally, totally avoided, an approach be totally avoid uh, aid? Uh, how should international aid be designed to bring about real substance, sustainable outcome by Emmanuel Yaka? And then uh, one question directed to Prof, uh, please elaborate on how language development can help our economic development is African culture where we carry our chiefs on the, on the head, not inimical to growth and development. Thank you. So um, I want to plead with you to just take uh, maybe a minute each, <laughs> because we really want to wind up now uh, to just reflect. And then we can, you can also type your responses in the Q&A room. Uh, so maybe Prof, since uh, we asked uh, Dr. Moleku to go first, this time you go first, and then she comes in. I want to thank Dr. Molenke for uh, Moleko for that wonderful submission. And I want to thank everybody. I think that uh, language development is key because you think in it and we are all what we think. See, our thinking has been impaired by adopting other people's language instead of our own. I cannot emphasize more on this because there's a reason why you dream in the language of your parents. So when we develop our language, and all modern words, we have them in our languages as the English language was done. And I cited William Shakespeare adding 2000 words to the language. 
It will help us to develop our own culture. It doesn't make sense to me in the 21st century to carry a cane on your head in a palanquin when there is no lessons of values from it. It doesn't make sense for you to go to a butchery or whatever, you know, catch a deer in the bush and say it's a, it's a tradition and what value does it bring to the youth? So we should begin to teach values from our culture, which is really important because values are everything. I know many Africans go to the embassy to ask for visa and they will deny them. Why? Because when you are talking to a white person and you are not looking at them in the face, they think you are lying. They want eyeball to eyeball, eye contact, interviews, everything. If you are not looking at a white person's face, eyeball to eyeball, you are lying to them. But in our culture, you cannot look eyeball to eyeball with your parents because that is disrespectful. So culture changes everywhere you go. But if you look at development of everywhere, it is based on the culture of the people. So there's a reason why people will not throw trash outside. They will not spit outside. They will not spit even gum outside. They will not pee outside. They will not poop outside. Why? Because the culture has been built that it is a no-no. We should begin to build values of that. Truthness, being honest, cleanliness. These are the cultures, you know, and discipline are the cultures we should build. I think that these are going to solve our problems for us because we have the resources already. All it takes a little bit of twist in the way we implement our laws, our regulations, the leaders model the way, the followers to speak to power, you know, and then prudently we share the little resources that we have. There will not be any corruption. People will tell the truth and then people will be free to believe in whatever religious practice they want to believe in. So I believe that we have the base. We need to build a pace. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Moleko. You have the final word before we wind up. Um, um, you, you have just about a minute of reflection. Thank you, Dr. Kofi. Um, thank you so much to my uh, keynote, uh, Professor Antwi, and to yourselves uh, as I close. My first point, uh, Dr. Kofi, let's deal with the structural fundamental constraints that are built into our economic structural system. The reason for Africa being where it is now, it was by design. It was designed that we are mainly extracting without beneficiation. It was by design that it was agreed that the wealth of our nations would not benefit us. It's also by design that we are being told and even taught that not only are we the smallest country uh, relative to others, but in fact, when we are the largest, when we not only have the resources that the world requires to actually survive and thrive, uh, but we are forced to almost sell them for a pittance because I still believe we are largely enslaved through the contractual obligations that enforced and are enabled to continue through some of the agreements that are in place now, through some of the legal and the economic agreements that establish and not only establish, but continue the systemic enforcement that we need to displace, we need to abolish, and we need to make sure is undone so that the people of Africa can benefit from the natural resource endowment. And I call the coat of many colors that she has been given. The second point uh, to uh, make is that our growth needs to be buttressed on economic productivity and action. I believe strongly that the church has a role to play. I also believe strongly uh, that we need to guard against self-dependence, self-reliance in the sense that we have seen, and I believe we have seen uh, many of the countries that have dominated over us, uh, really primarily having some form of uh, dominant altar that is operating in our continent. And we need to overcome those by destroying those altars and dealing with those through worship and prayer and to the Lord. So these are, I think, go hand in hand, the natural and the supernatural activities and actions. And to answer Emmanuel Yaka's question on aid, I believe that the best way to do aid for the benefit of Africans is if we have aid for trade. What do I mean by this? The manner in which aid comes is that usually multilateral or bilateral aid agreements is decided by the donor. The donor country tells us how to use this aid, where to use this aid, and sometimes to the extent of which service providers or consulting firms can benefit. 
to even the extent that they are beneficiaries in the host country and not local. So what we need to see is if aid is really intended to benefit us, we should direct that aid to helping us be more productive. And that is usually aid that is designed to be targeted toward trade. That trade aid should actually look at helping us meet requirements for trading, for exporting, helping us meet health requirements, health standards, any other export or other rigorous requirement that our countries would need to be fast-tracked and advanced in, help build that capability and capacity so that you have a workforce that is able to develop products and enable us to be at the level where our developed counterparts are, particularly from a capacity, competence, and meeting obligations and laws in that respect. I think that if we have non-financial support used to build our SMMEs, our small, our micro, and our medium-sized enterprises that don't have the resources of multinationals so that we can trade better, particularly for the African Free Continental Trade Agreement, for us to benefit from those, there's a lot of work that has to be done at a local level and by our agencies and institutions to benefit. So I think I'll close with that, Dr. Kofi, and thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Moleko. Um, I think um, you have set the stage for a broader conversation on where Africa goes from here. You have actually posed very pertinent questions as to what are the choices. You have provided some very critical answers to how these cho choices can be optimized. And you have also opened up the discussion on the whole issue about uh, self-sustenance and how we can manage that. Critical points you have made about uh, good governance, accountability, and designing, uh, taking our own destiny in our own hands and making uh, prof, you were very passionate about. We need to look internally and uh, uh, it's sometimes frustrating to see that we have everything it takes, uh, but we are not going forward. I think the issues that has come up in the conversation shows that the problem of leadership is critical. And that's why some believe, and you might see in the Q&A that some believe that the uh, move that is taken by SALT is to focus on developing leadership is very critical. Someone said that for a hairdresser to be qualified to dress a hair must have been trained for about two years, not more, not, not less. And yet we entrust the leadership of countries with the destiny of millions of people into hands of people who are clueless about leading people. So these are the conversations that we we'll continue to have, and we are grateful to you for coming to join us and leading this. Uh, Dr. Moleko, this is your second time, and we very much appreciate your, your passion, your insight. Prof, uh, thank you so much for opening up such a very important conversation. We will want to take it to the next level. It will be online on our social media platforms. Uh, join the conversation and see where people are asking and you can contribute to your, your own insights. At this stage, uh, I am compelled to wind up because we have overrun by a very, very wide margin. Uh, our friends in East Africa, some of them might be getting sleepy now. <laughs> and so the ones in South Africa, as well, we in West Africa, uh, we still have some late afternoon to, to, to wind up. So. I will hand over to Catherine to have some announcements, and then uh, she can call in the uh, designated person to share a word of prayer, and then we'll end there. Thank you very much, and God richly bless you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kofi, and thank you to our panelists. Uh, indeed, I can only echo that. Um, continue with that zeal, enthusiasm, and God richly bless you. So on to the announcements. Uh, please, technical team, may I request you to project those on screen? As the announcements are coming on, on screen, I can see them. Um, indeed, a good discussion never ends. So I'm sure that this is just the beginning of a great discussion that will not stop once the Zoom, the Zoom session ends. Let's continue the, the conversation. So I'd like to respect time. Um, indeed, we apologize for you know dragging it so much, but I would just like to run through the announcements some of them have already been um, shared during the uh, Inter-South Africa uh, video, so I will not repeat those. So
So for the next public lecture, please note that we will have the next public lecture um, in the, uh, the virtual public lecture, which is a flagship program of the SALT Institute, takes place um, four times in a year, so quarterly. And the next one uh, scheduled for this year takes place in November 2022. We'll communicate shortly the, the date, the exact date. But the theme has been set, and that is extremism in the Sahel. Kindly register in the SALT Institute Ghana website, and uh, that's projected on screen. And uh, briefly, um, I would just like to encourage you to still visit the SALT Institute website uh, because there's quite a lot of programs that are running and some are coming up. And uh, if we go to the next slide, kindly, please note that um, to apply for the admissions, uh, you kindly visit the SALT Institute website and uh, especially the page on admissions or contact the office and you hear is the WhatsApp number or you can even call. Uh, please note that the admissions for the next cohort is ongoing, so kindly hurry up on those. And then I will actually um, like to skip the Intercessors for Africa Education Foundation for Salt Institute because we've had a few minutes of our time earlier this afternoon, this evening, uh, taken through the, the video and exactly what is the mission and the vision for the Intercessors for Africa. So do well to uh, commit to making sure or to making uh, this vision and mission come into reality. Kindly visit the Salt Institute Ghana uh, or follow uh, on social media. We are in all social media, be it Facebook um, and, and all the other uh, social media. So thank you so much. I've tried to really run through the announcements considering the time. And now, dear participants, allow me to invite a prayer warrior and ambassador of Jesus Christ. Ambassador Novishi Abidu to wind us up in prayer. Please, Ambassador, you have the floor. Thank you. Shall we pray? Father, in the name of Jesus, we just want to thank you and to bless you for a time like this, for an opportunity to have this public lecture and to have a stimulation of discourse on leadership and transformation on the African continent. Thank you for the deep insights that have been shared. The fresh the uh, cross fertilization of ideas from various angles both the spiritual and the natural we thank you that this is not an academic discussion but a discourse which is going to generate more conversation and mindset transformation which will propel the active search for structural solutions to the transformation of our continent we pray for the salt institute that it will continue to drive the transformational agenda in africa we also pray that each and every one of us will seek to become the change that Africa desperately needs and brighten the corner where we are. We thank you so much, Lord, that you have already prophesied that in these end times, Africa has a role to play, a prophetic role in the end time agenda of being the forefront of the transformation of nations. And Lord, we ask that you will cause us to enter into this sort of mode by taking the strategic actions that will make us concretely deliver on the transformational front. Father, we ask that Lord, we call forth the Moseses, the Joseph, the Bezalels, the Holiabs, the Nehemas, the Esthers, and all those people that you have positioned who may be sleeping and who may not even realize that they have a role, that they will step up to the plate and begin to rebuild the ruins and to raise up the dissolution of many generations lord we just want to thank you that everything has gone well the technical uh, uh, what do you call it uh, things have all gone well the internet the sound everything the translators the interpreters have really been on top of issues and we want to close this seminar by giving you the praise and the glory and thanking you because you have been the beginning and the end of all things and we ask that by the time we get to the next lecture we would have entered into another phase of your agenda for the SALT Institute. We thank you and we bless you. In Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen and amen. 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 Thank you. Amen. Thank amen. you, Prof. Thank you, Doc. Thank you, dear participants. And um, God bless you all. Until next time, keep the fire burning. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Okay. Bye.